The time is now 1.04 p.m. and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education regular meeting of February 14, 2023 is called to order. Jen, are there individuals who wish to address the board during today's meeting? Yes, there are individuals who would like to address the board meeting today. Um, are, are any of them uh, yes. present? Yes, because we, have we do our two, present first. All right. Two in person. Um, each speaker will be limited to three minutes to address the board, and I will keep track of the time. We will be strictly following the time limits so that everyone has the opportunity to speak. It is the practice of the board not to respond to comments during the public participation portion of the meeting. We will maintain an atmosphere of respect for all people. Anyone disrespecting by name or otherwise will be asked to cease. Public participation will occur in person and virtually. We will begin with public participation with the persons that are physically in the room with us today and then move to those online. Um, up first is Liz Neely, followed by Bree Mogenberg. Liz Neely. Like me to stand here? Yep, you can go ahead and you sit. Have a seat if you want to. Okay. It's up to you. You can do that. <clears throat> okay. Hello, I'm Liz Neely. I'm a parent. Um, I have a fourth grader, second grader, and kindergarten. Um, I had the pleasure of putting their Valentine's Day cards and gifts together last night, which was a lot of fun. Um, and it just reminded me of that innocence that children have at such a young age. Uh, Matilda, she's six years old, and she decided that she was going to have white bags um, with pink hearts for the boys and pink bags and red hearts for the girls. And that's how she set her little system up. Regardless, I just think, um, you know, every kid is born with their individual view and um, their own character. So where does this lead me? The current bill um, is outlining some ways of which we should be identifying ourselves as a person. I'm just going to read this out loud. Sexual orient orientation means having an orientation for heterosexuality, homosexuality, or bisexuality, or having a history of such an orientation or being identified with such an orientation. Then we have gender identity or expression means having or being perceived as having a gender-related self-identity or expression whether or not associated with an individual's assigned sex at birth. Well, that's confusing, but I'm glad I have definitions now. Um, where this leads me to is, obviously, this is very inappropriate to have in an education setting. I would never, ever consent to that. Um, this past school year, free lunches came available, mandatory for everyone, I believe, every school in Michigan. So I was like, this is different. What is going on here? Well, I come across this food service administration memo number three that is requiring annual civil rights training um, for any of those participating in school nutrition programs. Digging a little further, looking at resources, um, not only does it outline gender identity or expression, um, it also outlines, let's see, including, we will not discriminate, including gender identity and sexual orientation. And that also um, recommends having posters, I guess, plastered in the schools. So I guess my question to the board is how did, how did these words, I guess, get introduced into our education system? That would be my question. Um, and going forward, how are we going to react um, in our education system to the language that's in this House bill? Very well, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Bree Mogenberg. Good afternoon. Bree Mogenberg from Mount Pleasant. I'm representative of Moms for Liberty of Isabella County. You probably all are well aware that last year I spent months here 
providing you and pleading with you to discuss our resolution for sexuality and gender content in Michigan public schools. Well, I would imagine that you probably consider me one of those parents that's part of the parent movement in which two board members here are going to discuss with other groups across Michigan how do you combat parents in the parental movement? The first thing that I really inquire you to implore yourselves upon, is there something wrong with parents being involved in their child's ed education? And why are you, some of you here, so determined to shut the parent down? That, to me, sounds a lot like something that Karl Marx would push upon the parents in the society, not to mention the sexuality that's being pushed upon the children. I've taken the time to review the resolution that's been proposed, and there is two words that are specifically left out of this resolution that are specifically stated in the law in the state of Michigan. Human sexuality. This resolution should be null and void because when you say family planning, reproductive health, and the prevention and treatment of sexually transmitted diseases, you are not putting in here what the law states. You must put in here human sexuality, which would also include rogue sex. If you're not sure what that is, you are all introduced to these badges. These badges are something you can get through the NEA LGBTQ caucus. And if you're not sure what your teacher can give to a student that's wearing this badge within just four clicks, you can take two combs, I'm sorry, they're actually brushes, a corn cob, and a roll of duct tape, and you can make a penetration toy that could harm a child. I'm not sure if that's what you want kids to take home with them, but this, in rogue sex, is the reason that parents want the right to opt their children out. I ask you to vote this down. Now I'm going to move on to mental health. There was something horrific that happened at MSU. I don't see that this state board mentioned anything about that. That is so completely hurtful. So completely hurtful. I would like to end saying guns are not the problem here. Mental health is an issue, and we have a problem in America because America has the most mental health disparities in the entire world. I ask you today to join me. Heavenly Father, we come to you today through your son, Jesus, and we thank you for the blessing of precious lives that continue to walk with us. I thank you for the prov provocateurs, and I pray to you that you stand with MSU and the Spartans, and you raise them up into healing and all of those that were victims of this. Please guide us with wisdom to address mental health wellness so that we are not put through more acts of terror. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for life. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move to virtual. Mike, if you could let the first caller in. State board mentioned anything about that. That's so completely hurtful. So completely hurtful. I was at. Is there a caller on the line? Mental health is an issue, and we have a problem. In Can you please mute the YouTube in the background? World. Hello? Hello, can you please state your name, where you're calling from, and provide your three minutes of comment? Uh, Mary Hall Rayford, calling from East Point, Michigan. Okay, go ahead. Okay, what I basically wanted to say was that this resolution really needs to be adopted, considering the fact that children are at risk of being harmed by further stigmatization because of who they are <clears throat> and who they choose to be. This is one of those things that if we don't do something to save our children, we're going to be facing a lot more problems than the one we, we have. And mental health is going to be at the top of the list because of the bullying and everything else. <clears throat> our kids deserve to be known for who they are and recognized as such, by Michigan Board of Education. Thank you. Next Thank caller. you. Considering the fact that children. All right, please mute the YouTube in the background. 
Can you please state your name, where you're calling from, and provide your three minutes of comment? Yes, my name is Shannon. I'm calling from Wyandotte, Michigan. Go ahead. Yes, I am calling to address the board today. Thank you for your time. I'm calling regarding um, the amendment proposed today regarding the sex education, um, rejecting third-party opt-out forms. I'm really concerned we should be looking at why the parents really feel a need to seek out the need to opt out out of the comprehensive sex education um, because concerned, we're very concerned about the curriculum behind the books and the messaging, the values that are anti-American, um, sexualizing children, the political culture that's leaking into our K-12 education with gender theory. It's very confusing and dangerous for children. Um, our children are being threatened and they're easy targets. Um, no one is uh, trying to make a disruption in the schools. We are sincerely advocating for our parental rights. Um, you should uphold these. They're very important. Schools should not have to, um, they should be able to work with the parents regarding these issues and um, we should respect them. and. Um, empower parents to be involved more in education instead of attacking the parents and provoking them. Thank you for my comments. Um, please vote down this resolution. Thank you for your time. Thank you Bye -bye. for calling. <clears throat> please state your name, where you're calling from, and provide your three minutes of comment, please. Hi, Megan Spencer from Oxford, Michigan. Go ahead and start, please. Um, basically, just to summarize, um, I do not support the defunding of the DEI. I would like the, the free meals back at all public schools for all grade levels. Um, and with MSU last night dealing with another tragedy here in America, I would really like to see mental health be considered top priority statewide. And that is all. Thank you for calling. <clears throat> Hello, please state your name, where you're calling from, and provide your three minutes of comments, please. Good afternoon. I am Jennifer Tuxel from Rochester Hills, representing Michigan Parent Alliance for Safe Schools also known as my test. Here is our comment. Today, our hearts break for the families whose lives have been shattered by yet another mass shooting in Michigan. The second in 18 months at a place where our children are supposed to learn in safety. We grieve with the entire Spartan community. This morning, as parents wave goodbye to our children for another day at school, we are terrified, we are angry, and we demand action. We want to thank you for not putting the resolution on the agenda to defund DEI initiatives. Research shows that DEI improves the emotional, academic, and social well-being of our children. In the face of unprecedented gun violence and mental health crises in our schools, we should be doing everything in our power to fund and support diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as social emotional learning initiatives. We also thank you for placing the resolution regarding opting out of rogue sex ed on the agenda. While leaders of GSI insist that they and their opt-out form are not homophobic, repeated rhetoric from their leaders calling children the alphabet mafia and appearing alongside pastors calling gay marriage a tool of Satan suggests otherwise. Furthermore, their rhetoric promotes a distrust of our children's teachers. Rather than attacking our teachers, we should be advocating for them and trusting them as the experts that they are. Much like calls to defund DEI, insisting teachers are teaching rogue sex ed is nothing more than a distraction from the real issues facing our schools and our children. With that said, we encourage the board to pass this resolution and to call on parents across Michigan to stop 
pushing culture war nonsense so we can work on legislation and solutions that can actually save lives and improve our schools. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Can you please mute the YouTube in the background? Calling gay marriage a tool of suggests otherwise. Furthermore, the rhetoric promotes a distrust of our children's teachers. Rather, Hello? Can you please mute the YouTube in the background? Much like calls to defund DEI, insisting teachers are teaching wrong Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Hello. Please state your name, where you're calling from, and provide your three minutes of comment, please. <clears throat> Hi, this is Gina Keller. I'm calling from Bloomfield Hill. I'm calling because uh, today I want to talk about keeping kids safe and protecting our children. That's what we're all here for today. When we are going to argue about what the real threat to our kids are, we need to stop talking about pretend culture wars. No one wants porn in schools, and I don't think we have actual proof of that yet. But what we do have is dead children from school shootings. We have children in body bags right now. Gun homicides in the U.S. are 26% higher than in peer nations. We do not want to turn our schools into prisons rather than addressing the issue of guns. We've had six school shootings in 2023 already. We have children in Michigan who have now lived through two mass shootings. We need to address guns. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Those are all the registered callers. Talk about keeping kids safe and protecting our children. <laughs> this concludes public participation at 121. Do we have Mr. Yukini no. right ready? No. I had turned it over. Is she reaching up in now? Yes. <clears throat> President Q, are you ready uh, to do your board member comments? Um, why don't we uh, why don't we do the meeting minutes and then okay. uh, and then I give you a Board members, we are we're going to juggle our agenda a little bit uh, because of the relative brevity of our um, public comment. We are going to move to uh, regular meeting approval of State Board of Education meeting minutes from January 10th, 2023. Could I please have a motion to approve the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of January 10th, 2023? Moved by Dr. Robinson. Do I have a second? Seconded by uh, Ms. Lipton. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Bullock? Yes. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, very good. <clears throat> and then, uh, Madam President, are you ready for your, um, for your remarks? I believe I am. Okay. So, um, as you all can see by my shirt um, and the candy that's out here, you know, it's Valentine's Day, um, but I know that our hearts are heavy as, you know, we think of those who have been harmed, the lives that have been lost, and the parents and the family members who have been, is it time? <laughs> yeah, you're all done. <laughs> That's good, a light moment, but you know, do we do? Um, but our thoughts and our prayers are with Miss Barton family and East Lansing community. Um, but we know that too often our children are witnessing this gun violence. Um, some of us even have children here at this table who were very close to that um, and family members. And we now know that um, firearms are the number one uh, killer of, of our children. And so as we put out a resolution, maybe just about two or three months ago, um, it's time for us to um, continue to advance, to call on, and to um, demand 
that this be treated as the public health crisis that it is and that sensible gun, gun laws are put in place. We know that the legislature um, has proposed those and so we will be watching, uh, we will be advocating uh, for those laws to be enacted now. And we stand with many family members who have been asking and asking and asking for the same. Pivoting, it is Black History Month. Um, we will soon have a Black History Month speaker, I hope. Um, but this is a time that we celebrate. Um, and most are focusing on the resilience and tenacity of Americans, Black Americans, and our history, our rich culture, and our continued plight for equity and justice. And I want to thank board members, uh, Mitchell Robbins, Dr. Robinson, board member Robinson, board member Tilly, and uh, Dr. Rice for being a part of our first virtual education town hall and just being there to listen, to listen to uh, community members, parents, students, as well as uh, educators uh, uh, that, that across the state on what is at stake around our public education system. And we start, we're starting with three communities. Last week, we were in the Detroit area, Detroit Southeast Michigan area. Uh, we heard from two superintendents. Uh, we heard from parents. We heard from, from students and um, parents of children with special needs. And the town halls are centered, centered on um, educational equity and justice. And again, they're, they're we've been sitting in a listening role. Those town halls are hosted by Senator Erica Geis, uh, Angela Waters Austin, and myself. Um, the organizations are One Love Global, Michigan for Black Lives, Michigan Legislative Black Caucus, and Global African Business Association. Uh, the next one will be Thursday, uh, and I can send information for those who, who want to participate on those virtual town halls. Flint and Saginaw will be the area of focus. Uh, Thursday the 23rd, we will be in Lansing and west side of the state, and again, they're virtual. I did yesterday have an opportunity, um, yesterday evening before the tragic event, I, I did have an opportunity to see the governor and to thank her for uh, the budget that she has proposed and put forth. And um, whether we're talking about universal uh, meals, universal pre-K, weighted budget formula, healthy, safe, and supported learning environments that include tutorial services, um, necessary expertise being involved when it comes to uh, making sure that our buildings are safe um, and healthy, or whether we're talking about the involvement of community um, as we look to address our literacy, literacy rates. Um, there's just a lot of good stuff that's in the budget, and I'm happy that I had the chance to tell her thank you, and especially as it relates to the unprecedented um, showing of support and commitment for the environments that our children learn in, as well as the health of our children. And so I think that's all that I have for thank, my report. Thank you, President yeah. Pugh. And then in the in the spirit of, uh, of juggling, we are going to move to, um, to our uh, initial statement on read by grade three that Dr. Pritchett proposed that was put onto the agenda uh, at the beginning of the uh, of the meeting, uh, Dr. Pritchett, to you to to share uh, about this resolution, please. All right, um, I think it makes sense for me to move to make the motion first, get support, and then we can discuss. All right, um, I would like to move to accept the statement of support uh, to repeal the required retention portion of the third grade uh, reading law. We have a motion and we have a, a second from a motion by Dr. Pritchett, second by Dr. Robinson, uh, followed uh, close behind by, by Ms. Lipton uh, and Mr. Bullock. <laughs> um, discussion to you, the, uh, the, the mover of the motion. All right, thank you. Uh, during this past month's uh, legislative committee meeting, which was held on February 2nd, uh, we discussed as a group uh, the fact that um, this law has been uh, in place since 2016. 
Uh, the board has always supported the premise of the law, which is uh, multiple assessments to determine where students may need assistance with their literacy um, and to uh, provide support uh, for um, through training, through uh, budget requests for um, those uh, evidence-based interventions for students. What this board has consistently um, uh, voiced their concerns about is the mandatory retention portion of that statute, which in essence says that after a child takes the third grade M-step, uh, if they don't reach a certain level as determined by um, MDE, uh, that parents are notified by June 1st, uh, and the student is to be retained in third grade. Um, and we have discussed at this table before, and it's been discussed in other uh, places, the uh, research behind that uh, and how that, in essence, flies against the research related to child development. Um, and there's no uh, clear indication that it uh, helps at all, and if anything, it hinders uh, as students reach um, middle school and into high school. So it was the decision of the committee that we um, provide a statement of support because we know this bill is currently being discussed and um, I believe has been voted out of the Senate at this point um, as we became aware that it was being discussed in not only the Senate Education Committee but House Education Committee. So we decided we'd put together a a uh, statement of support uh, for those discussions as far as repealing the uh, retention portion. So that's where we're at with this motion. Thank you, Dr. Pritchett. Um, any other discussion on the um, on the motion to uh, support this particular statement in opposition of read by grade three retentions? Um, Just so, want to publicly? Ms. I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Snyder, oh, then sorry. Dr. Robinson. That's okay. Yeah. I would just like to move to amend the statement to include wherever you so choose, if you would support it. Um, we recommend the House adopt an amendment on page 10, line 13, that reads as follows. Um, and just to give context, and then I'll, I'll quote the amendment that I'm suggesting. So on page 11, line 10, you can read where... Uh, Page 11 of the bill itself, okay. which I could tell you there's so much crossing out that we can 12. figure out the subsection. Yeah. Okay. So Senator Polhanke suggested that the way that they're notifying parents has changed. So this relates to that. Shall include an explanation in the notification concerning what constitutes a reading deficiency and shall include in the notification information concerning interventions that are available to the pupil to address the pupil's reading deficiency. So for this bill to be effective, I, I would suggest we say cross out are available to the pupil to address the pupil's reading deficiency and state the local school district is required to provide to the pupil to address the pupil's reading deficiency as opposed to notifying the parent what's available to that pupil what are you required to do for that pupil? Okay, is this, uh, just a, a point of clarification, is this what, what, what was passed yeah. on amendment in the, the Senate? Because Senator Ruth Johnson offered an amendment around notification to the parent. <coughs> um, that amendment was accepted and was incorporated, if I recall correctly, into the bill that was um, that was approved. Is that? Are so, I have the Senate bill right here yeah. that is now in the House, mm -hmm. and I've read it. And as a state board member, I really suggest that we recommend that change that the House adopt. So, was this? Is this? I don't know what. Already, I don't okay. know what she provided. I'm just reading the bill as it's moved out of the Senate. Okay. Reading Senate Bill 12. Correct. It's As it was passed by the Senate and it's now Senate. sitting over in yep. the House. And if we read it together, which these, the bold lettering that the Senate wants moved to the House and passed, the notification to parents includes information concerning interventions that are available to the pupil to address the pupil's reading deficiency. 
I recommend that we as a body consider information concerning interventions that the school district is required to provide the pupil to address the pupil's reading deficiency. Tell me, um, tell me, do you, do you perceive those to be different for every child or the same for every child? So that's the next thing we should talk about. Later in the bill, I mean, and I have a few amendments that I think we should add to this statement that should go to the House that should really, I think, beef up the conversation. But it talks about I, the motions on the table. Do you guys have any questions about that motion or? Yeah, where in, where in, I'm looking at 12. Where does it, where would? It's on page 11. It's the bolded uh, language that is changed via the Senate. You want me to pass it to you, Tom? As a reading deficiency. I guess the question becomes, what would the change in this motion be? Because this is the motion before the sure. state board. And I am, so what would you recommend this motion be amended to be? I have moved to amend the statement to include, we recommend the House adopt an amendment, we'll figure out subsection and the line that reads as follows. And if you pull up the bill, you can see the bolded language. I'll read it again. It says information concerning interventions that are available to the pupil to address the pupil's reading deficiency. I'm asking our board to consider changing that language, encouraging the house to change that language through this statement to read information concerning interventions that the local school district is required to provide the pupil to address the pupil's reading deficiency. I could type it out. Well, it would, it, as, as a it rule, it would be helpful. But it, it, but it's before it's before the the board for consideration. Just just one more point of clarification: what literacy interventions are required? Actually, which you are referring. I think the better question then is: what literacy interventions does the Michigan Department of Education suggest are required? to remedy reading deficiencies for kids let, let, let's in our be, schools. Let, let's be clear, okay? We have a motion that has been properly seconded on the, on the table. Second we, are, we are considering this. So you have a motion to amend mm -hmm. the, the motion. We've got a second, and now it's to you to explain your motion, not to have a broad conversation sure. about literacy, Will to do. focus on the amendment to the motion. Yes. I would like it so that we recommend to the House to change the language that has been changed in the Senate. It is one thing for a public education system to say, I'm going to notify parents what's available to your child to correct your reading the child's reading deficiency and what is required of the school district. Those are two different words, and as it relates to correcting pupils' reading deficiencies or students' reading deficiencies, I think that should be differentiated. Okay, fair enough. So we have a motion. It's been properly seconded. Uh, there's been an explanation of the, the motion. It, it, would, um, it would add in pertinent part to Dr. Pritchett's resolution a, a, an exhortation to the House of Representatives that they uh, are encouraged to consider language regarding not the availability of reading interventions, but the requirement of particular reading interventions associated with literacy uh, gaps of an individual child. Depending on uh, what those gaps may be. That's, that's exactly that's a, what would the decision a teacher and parent, right. or primarily right. the teacher would make. Right. These letters are sent out by the state. And they are not sent out by the local school district. Correct. They are sent out by the state. And they are uh, a single letter sent out to, uh, to every uh, parent, parent of every child right. um, below 1252 on the third grade uh, ELAM step. So we have, a, we have a motion. We have a second. We've had some uh, explanation thereof. Um, Dr. Pritchett, any response associated therewith? No, um, except where are we going to put it on this? Or do you want to vote first on the suggestion and then we'll place it? Would, would this be a specific listing of the required literacy interventions 
for a, a particular individual. So later in the bill, you have a breakdown of the interventions. And it talks about, I don't, I don't want to quote the wording incorrectly, so give me a moment. This program must include effective instructional strategies necessary to assist the people in becoming a successful reader and all of the following features as appropriate for the needs of the individual people. Right. So, and then it goes on to list all of them. However, if the notification letter only states what's available as opposed to what's required, I think it should be consistent with the language of must so that a parent knows exactly what's happening to remedy their student's reading deficiency. Just so we understand that entire statute, part of that statute is the teacher, parent, and parent uh, do sit down after the child takes the assessment and they map, the teacher explains to the parent in collaboration, these are the types of interventions I, the teacher, am going to provide for your students. So that, that is part of the statute. It might be word recognition for student A, and student B may have word recognition, but they need to work on comprehension, and so they would indicate that, and it's called the individual reading plan, unless they've changed the name of that since I read the original statute. So that, that automatically is in the statute. So I think that we're still dealing with the notification language and the concept that that's a detailed conversation that will follow the notification right. that Paul Hankey wrote in here. Right. So I just think we need to be really clear that when the parent gets the letter, they, they are aware that this isn't just something that's available to their student, that it's, that it's something that's required by law, and that the local school district will follow through with it. I think that's fair language. And then at that point, it has to be tailored to that particular student, Correct. depending on what their deficiencies yes. may be. Well, different children have different right. challenges, Especially and uh, accommodating that um, in a form letter is not possible. But the um, individual reading plan would then be, that meeting would take place with the teacher and the parents. So. We could certainly develop some kind of software recognizing, boxes. Recognizing an individual reading plan is completely legitimate. Right. Um, that is required. Um, but specific interventions beyond that, right. not. No. So um, to list a whole list of interventions just becomes a list, but to indicate that the individual reading plan meeting will occur for that parent. Um, Fair enough. So would you like to amend your, uh, your request for amendment? to a, a notation of the requirement of the individual reading intervention plan? No, because I, based on what I read that came out of the Senate, so hopefully, I, I think we understand each other, but I just think it's about figuring out what, what makes sense of it. It's going to include information concerning interventions that are available if this bill passes, right? The House. It's gone through the Senate. It's going to go through the House. So. If we are being earnest, which I think we all are in this conversation, instead of it being information concerning interventions that are available, it needs to be information concerning interventions that are required. The, uh, what specific interventions are you referring to? What it takes to address a pupil's reading deficiency. What specific interventions so are if you, you referring go on to? to the when you use the term required in statute, it, it has a, a legal connotation. Right. It I is not a pedagogical, it's, it's a legal connotation. So I'm asking you what specific interventions are you referring to? The interventions that are in the bill that apply to what it takes to address reading deficiencies the, the, in students. The interventions that are in the bill are a menu. They are not a series of requirements. It is a menu from which local school uh, staff, along with parents, work with children to, to implement. So are you suggesting that when parents get letters of notification about their child's reading deficiency, they're going to get notification of a menu of options that are available, 
or are they going to get a notification of what's required for that student, their child's reading deficiency to be corrected? Which is it? They, the letter that has been sent out is a, a broad letter indicating that your child is below 1252 on the third grade ELA and that uh, he or she is uh, eligible for retention. At the same time, he or she is eligible, eligible for a just cause exemption. And there are several just cause exemptions. And there's conversation or description in the letter about how you uh, access those just cause, <laughs> that just cause intervention. Uh, children get educated um, and, and improve their reading at the local school district level. Um, it's not magical with a letter from, from anyone, let alone from someone that doesn't educate children. I'd like to pose my question one more time. Fine. When parents get notification from our public education system that their student has a reading deficiency, should they receive notification of a menu of options that are available to their student to correct that reading deficiency? Or should they receive notification of what's required and what the school district will actually do for that student to correct the reading deficiency? The term required has no inherent meaning in the, um, in the, in the question. The requirement under law and the requirement pedagogically are two different things. And the ability to assess that at a distance is um, your responsibility. Is is no the the responsibility for the specific education of specific children is at the local school district level, where children are educated on a daily basis. Ms. Lipton, to you. Thank you. Um, I just want to, you know, go back to what um, this particular statement. Um, says and what we're doing. My understanding is that this is a statement in support mm -hmm. of a repeal of a required retention. And it's not, even a, it's not even a resolution. It's a statement supporting broadly repealing the required retention portion of the law and retaining requirements for evidence-based literacy interventions and instruction. I don't see any need to further amend or change that statement. It is a very clear and broad statement, which I think is entirely in keeping with what um, is in the wheelhouse of this body. As it comes to specifically delineating or suggesting amendments to particular legislation, I don't believe, it's my, my personal opinion, that that goes beyond the scope of a broad-based statement in support of a particular um, uh, policy that has been in place that we're suggesting be repealed. Um, so I, I think that from, for, for, for my purposes, at least, this statement is, um, is complete as it is. Thank you very much, Ms. Lipton. Dr. Pugh, to you, Mr. Bullock, and then Ms. Thank you. And, and I, what I understand um, is what Board Member Snyder is trying to get at is making sure that parents are communicated with as clearly as possible. Um, and, and I'm all for that. Uh, the, um, and I an approach that we may be able to take. And I mean, I guess I don't know that it's necessarily speaking to the legislate, legislators or the, the legislation. And we're, we're really talking to the, um, the House um, where this, this is now. And I guess, if, is there any way that we could add a uh, last sentence that, you know, the State Board of Education um, further recommends and maybe something that like any final version adopted clearly communicates that by law there are interventions available to pupils. Does that, uh, how does that sound, Dr. Rice, to your, to your point of not going through what each intervention is or does that, does that then trigger or sound as if there's 
one, one shoot, that there's a, a, a cookie cutter approach for all of these interventions. But my thought would be a last sentence and something that, that speaks to making sure it's clearly communicated to parents um, that by law there are Okay, I'm sorry. The, the um, to your to your question, there are um, there are several elements that are um, available to be considered in a reading intervention. Um, they include, but aren't limited to, a highly effective teacher of reading, the highest evaluated grade three teacher, a reading specialist, reading programs that are evidence-based, reading instruction intervention for the majority of pupil time each day, um, targeted, uh, daily targeted small group or one-to-one -one reading intervention, administration of ongoing progress monitoring assessment, supplemental evidence-based reading intervention, um, providing parents, legal guardians, or other providers uh, of care for the pupil with a read-at-home plan. I mean, there's several of these, and they're presented in statute as um, opportunities. They're not presented as uh, thou shalt provide the following mm -hmm. to young people, okay. but rather here are among the things that can be offered to, um, to, to young people or that schools need to consider to improve reading instruction. So it's not, it's not precisely formulaic. Right. Right. But, but, but there, there are required interventions. It's just that we don't know what that intervention <laughs> looks like for each child. And no parent can just go out and get any intervention that, that they want. There's uh, a set of, there's various interventions or none are required. I mean, the IRIP is required. The the inner the um, the individual reading plan. intervention plan is um, is required. Regular assessments of the child are um, are required, but there isn't a requirement, say for example, to have a particular teacher teach the child or particular right. uh, supplemental instruction to be done or or one to one tutoring. Although each of these is important, none of them is required right. under statute. Right. Any of them may be required by knowledge of an individual child. They may be required pedagogically. In other words, uh, experts looking at this child may say this child needs A, B, and C. So they're required from the vantage point, from the lens of pedagogy, but not necessarily from the lens of, of, of statute. Dr. Rice. Please. I just, um, that last sentence that we had and going with Dr. Pugh's thought about possibly adjusting something here. Um, State Board of Education therefore recommends and encourages the members of the Michigan legislature to repeal the required retention portion of the law and retain requirements for evidence-based <coughs> literacy interventions and instruction to be provided to students, and I'm inserting this just to see how this flo floats, as will be determined at a reading intervention plan meeting. So. Because that is required in the statute. There has to be a reading intervention plan meeting if a child is reading below the... I think that Nikki's... My, go, go my ahead. skill set is a little rusty, but I was <laughs> trying to find exactly what the amendment by Senator Johnson in, the, the, mm -hmm. in order to get members on board and make it right. bipartisan. Exactly. Senator Johnson and... Was it Bellino? I can't remember who it was. Their intentions, the reason they held out at committee in order to get it to the floor, the amendment was to be clear and concise in notifying parents right. Right. that there right. is a reading deficiency. So then the separate piece is it goes, the school is district by district and child by child. So sure. you're not going to, they have to, mm -hmm. you, you know, it's the shall or, or must. That's why she held out. And with her intentions, that's how she sent it to the House. I wouldn't want to interfere with that okay. in getting it passed in a, in a manner. But I think that's her intention, is to make sure 
the parents are clearly notified right. that there is a reading deficiency in their child by the notification. If that's I can't. I couldn't and that, find and that, the and, amendment itself. Right, and that and that's what currently exists. The the of course, in addition to that, it's the default is your child should be retained, and to the extent that he or she isn't retained, it's because you've accessed a good cause exemption. And to make sure that those resources are available at the next level, right? So that, that's right. Yeah. Next year, yes. whether that's in third so grade or fourth grade. Come to this meeting. Find out what's going on. And this is what's going to happen. Right. And that's what I hear Dr. Pritchett saying as well, referencing that, that uh, basically a, a meeting on the IRIP. And the clarification that it wasn't, in my brain, I thought it was a resolution. You're saying it's just a statement, which changes. This is, this is a statement. Yeah, but let's, yeah. But I mean, let, let, let's, be, let's be clear. When it gets to the legislature, it, it, it's, it, as you know, yes. it, it's simply, oh, what's the state board say? Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're not looking so much at the form, resolution versus statement, right. as what's the position so of, the, of the state board. Please. Everyone's jumping in, so I just want to, let, let me just finalize what I'm, I, first of all, I support the statement, and mm -hmm. I, I do appreciate the concerns that are rooted in the statement, even though we really, I mean, we had 500 or so students that were held back. I'm assuming those were for absolute honest, necessary reasons, right, and if there's agreement there. Agreement. So the concept of mandatory retention is sort of a, it's, it's not really something that was even playing out in real time, but okay, I'm going to support this. I appreciate that. However, if you have um, parent notification that says available versus required, it, it's, it's just different. What happens with a parent who's not going to show up to that RIP meeting? We still follow through by law with the interventions that are required for that student. Per what the individual teacher at that point, let's say I'm the teacher, I've received the information from the MSTEP and other assessments, I want to keep throwing that out, and now I've determined that I have a child here who needs work with comprehension. I invite the parent to the meeting so we can discuss that together, so the parent can do some things at home, and this as the teacher, this is what we're going to do this year. Child's now in fourth grade. Um, if the d parent, for whatever reason, can't attend that meeting, that's still what the teacher will continue to do, best practice, you know, evidence-based interventions, and continue to communicate with the parent, this is what we're doing, you know, uh, these are the interventions. So that's why, by referencing that reading plan meeting, um, where the parent would be invited to. Uh, it's not only the parent, I think it's the administrator of the building, also the principal needs to be there. Um, to me, that, you know, then takes care of this instead of, because this form letter they get from the state isn't going to have a list of interventions. It's just going to say your child um, didn't reach this particular benchmark or score and now they are, you know, eligible, or um, I haven't seen the letter, but um, moving on to fourth grade, and there will be, because that's in the statute, and, and I think that is, have always supported that. Yeah, I think will be is even better than available, right? Available just like it sounds like a menu of options as opposed to this is what we are going to do. So if we say will be as determined at the RIP meeting, um, that phrase there after student, mm -hmm. um, then I think what we've said is this has to be, this has to happen. And what's the timeline of that letter that they receive in comparison to the RIP meeting? When does the RIP meeting have to happen after that letter is received? Um, it's my understanding that the RIP meeting would happen then at the beginning of the next year. 30 Correct, days. Dr. Rice, because they don't get the letter till June 1st. Now we're at the end of the school year. They, they may Mrs. not get. They may not get the letter June first. I mean, the reality is, is that a lot, a lot turns on right. uh, when the letters go out, when kids test, when the letters go out. Yeah, depending on when whether they get the, the addresses results are, the are correct. But so, yes, you're talking. You're into next school year. Yeah, you're talking. But you know, Thanksgiving in, in a ish. Oh, I would hope before then, okay. but certainly in a perfect world, would be the first month of school. 
but but children have individual reading intervention plans long before um, they fall prey to, to right. this law. This is this is once you've been designated as 1252 or below right. on that third grade M step. This is looking forward, and so what you recommend is the insertion. Um, at the second to last line after the word students. Correct. As determined at an individual reading intervention program meeting between the parent and school staff. Yes. So you, you pick up the required pieces which will be in the IRIP. Right. Okay. Uh, Dr. Pugh and then, no, Dr. Pugh and no, no you. Um, very good. Sorry. I just wanted, I just wanted to make sure that we were clear. It, it, to me, it seemed like it, it, what Nikki was proposing wasn't necessarily a change to the legislation, but just how we're communicating it right. to the parent and making sure that that's known to the legislature. Um, it sounds like all the pieces are already there. It just sounds like we're... I wasn't... So, yes, but it is. It's take, it goes from shall or must. So, mm -hmm. it's it's a... In general, we this is what we're going to do. And she's saying, no, change the word on the package to required. required. So now, mm -hmm. 110 people got to agree to that. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Or argue about a word. <laughs> and I, I'm just gonna say. I mean, I, I like what 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 Judy has yeah, proposed. Not, yeah, yeah. I just don't know that that then gets to the parents. I mean, that that gets yeah. to the language of. So, but I'm I'm good with it. But I'm I'm just wanting to. And, and I think we can work on it. Clear. We have yeah, a, it's not a bad. We have an yeah. amendment, and then we do. We have a we have we have a we have a oh. we, we have. Uh, what's on the floor? No, what's, we, what's on the floor is Miss Snyder's um, proposed amendment. And so um, we can vote that up and down, uh, up or down. And or. Um, once once voted up or down, hold on one second. Once voted up or down, you can then cleanly reconsider something else. Um, you could uh, consider an, an amendment to her amendment, which becomes uh, more and more rabbit hole like, if you'd like. But we can do that. I think that's what Judy's already kind of done. Well, that's why I was going to like well, but she has you. She can make a friendly amendment to, and we can just go that one route, right? And well, she she made an amendment. It's been seconded. I don't hear that it's risen to the level of friendly at this point. Um, <laughs> for to for to, okay. for to rise to the level of friendly, just friendly just amendment. just a a, a a matter of uh, structure. <laughs> It has to be agreed to yeah. by the the uh, the introducer of the motion. And the second. So um, friendly. There you go. I don't know uh, whether Tom can be, but Nikki and I can be friendly here. I'm, I'm delighted. <laughs> so in in the context though of this resolution, okay, um, are you accepting the change to add something that will require, um, and what is precisely required? Yes, and then I suggested what would go in there. Okay, so so what what your interpretation, uh, which you've accepted, um, uh, uh, is that um, that there be an addition to accommodate uh, Ms. Snyder's uh, concern to say, as determined at an individual reading intervention program meeting between the parent and school staff. Yes. Okay. I accept your friendly amendment. Thank Very good. You. So, 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 so we have an acceptance of the acceptance of the acceptance of the friendly amendment. Um, any, any other questions, Ms. Lipton? To you. Okay. So the so the original motion to amend the statement has been withdrawn. Um, and we're now just it, looking at. It has been it has been amended. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Friendly, friendly amendment. amendment. Let okay. the amendment roll. So we're just we're dealing with. <laughs> One amendment. We're dealing with, we are doing a single amendment that says, as determined at an individual reading intervention program meeting between the parent and school staff, um, that is the friendly amendment. It has been accepted by the mover. Um, has it been accepted by the seconder? It has been, who seconded it? Tom. Tom. Tom? Uh, that was the, no, the, the original motion is what you're asking. I am. Yeah, and I the original who, motion who seconded was yours. seconded, I believe, by uh, Dr. Robinson. You beat us. You were the second to accept Dr. Robinson said. <laughs> <laughs>
Who okay, Mitch? <laughs> I knew that Senator Joe Manchin was a member of the Michigan State Board of Education. It is, so, so friendly amendment has been accepted. The, the motion is amended. amended. Any other uh, discussion? Hearing none, a roll call vote on the motion as amended. Bullock? Yes. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Robinson? Yes. <laughs> Snyder? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Motion carried. Works. Very good. Thank you so much, uh, board. Uh, board, we are going to pivot to our uh, Black History Month speaker now. And um, as we celebrate Black History Month, one of our board members, co-vice president Tiffany Tilly, recommended our presenter, Mr. Malik Yakini, as someone who would give a thoughtful presentation. Mr. Yakini is a longtime educator, formerly executive director of Ensorama um, Institute African Centered Academy, and currently the executive director of Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. He will be presenting to us today on growing our humanity through studying African and African American history and culture. This presentation will discuss the suppression of African and African American history and culture in American schools. Mr. Yakini is attending and presenting virtually during today's session. This is an informational presentation. No board action is required. Mr. Yakini, welcome to the State Board of Education. You may you. begin when you are ready. Thank you so much, Dr. Rice. And I'd like to thank uh, your staff also for helping to facilitate this presentation. I want to thank my good friend, uh, board member Tiffany Tilly. And I have to give a shout out to my former state senator and homeboy, Marshall Bullock. Thank you, there, um, brother. Thank you. Thank you. So as I'm sure all of you know, February has been celebrated as Black History Month in the United States. Actually, since 1970, when it was celebrated at Kent State University, but formally, uh, United States President Gerald Ford declared February to be Black History Month in 1976, the bicentennial anniversary of the founding of the United States. So I'd like to get right into my uh, PowerPoint presentation. And uh, if you give me just, just a minute to pull that up. And actually, I, th I thought we had this all worked out, but I might need some assistance in figuring out how to share. Let's see, I think I'm getting there. We've got all sorts of people assisting all sorts of people in all sorts of ways today. <laughs> okay. Uh, give me just a second, and I hope I have this pulled up. Okay, you may be looking at an email now, which is not what I want you to see. But. <laughs> Karen, oh. I think, can you see my screen now? Can you see the PowerPoint? We cannot, no. Oh. Yeah. Okay, I'm wondering if somebody can, can assist we, Can we perhaps, I am um, happy can to we pull put, that up. put it up? That would yes. be great, yeah. Okay. Okay, and I can't see what you're looking at, so I'm hoping... I will have it in just a minute. Look at that, she's good. Great. She's got Zoom skills. Okay, we can go back to the previous slide. Okay, great. So we're going to talk about uh, growing our humanity. And the basic premise uh, that serves as the foundation of this presentation is that none of us can be fully human if we deny the humanity of any part of the human family. And uh, so we'll get into it. Next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, Black History Month has been formally recognized in the United States since 1976, but it builds on an earlier legacy that was created by African-American historian and journalist Carter G. Woodson, who started Negro History Week in February of 1926. Next slide. 
the fact that we still have Black History Month speaks to our collective acknowledgement that the history of African Americans has been and continues to be suppressed. Next slide. So while we readily acknowledge that uh, we have not learned African and African American history in such in a robust way, what is not as often acknowledged is that this has done damage to our collective humanity. Again, that we can none of us can be fully human unless we understand how Africa's children have contributed to the development not only of the United States but of world civilization. Next slide. However, examining that history is, all, is not always nice. And in, in fact, it may shatter some of our perceptions about the United States as the world's moral leader. Uh, as anyone who has studied even in a perfunctory way the history of the Western Hemisphere, we know that both the United States and the other nations of the Western Hemisphere exist on land that was obtained through genocide and displacement of the indigenous populations. <laughs> Next slide. Also a perfunctory study of the history of the Western Hemisphere uh, will, will teach us that enslaved Africans were in fact provided the labor that was the engine that drove the economies of Portugal, of Holland, of England, Spain, and France and their colonies in the so-called Western Hemisphere. Uh, the same is true for the United States. And I'm using the term so-called Western Hemisphere because even that term is rooted in a Eurocentric view of the world that centers Europe not only on the maps that we are most familiar with, but centers Europe in the center of our consciousness. And it determines geography of the rest of the world in relationship to Europe. So we have terms like the Middle East, the Far East, far in relationship to what? Far in relationship to Europe. And so part of undoing this legacy of Eurocentricity and white supremacy is also re-examining language. Next slide. The descendants of Africa have contributed tremendously to American culture in all ways, and that includes agriculture, and we have a picture of the patron saint of organic agriculture, Dr. George Washington Carver. Uh, Africans have also contributed to science, technology, music, dance, literature, theater, and the visual arts. Next slide. Again, by suppressing these truths and the deep wisdom that is buried in the culture of black, brown, and indig indigenous people, we are all deprived of access to this wisdom. And it's my view that this is the very wisdom that can help us to grow humanity and save the planet. Next slide. Now, as we look back historically, the process of convincing the populations of England, Spain, France, Portugal, Holland, uh, that it was moral to conquer and enslave Africans and indigenous peoples of the so-called Western Hemisphere require the creation of myths that dehumanize those peoples. Next slide. Uh, one of those myths was that Africans are lower on the evolutionary scale and that Europeans are somehow the pinnacle of human development. And in fact, uh, this pseudoscience is represented in the graphic that you see uh, on this slide which shows a person that presumably is Roman or Greek as, again, the pinnacle of human development and an African uh, being kind of the stage in between apes and uh, white people. Another myth that was perpetuated is that Africans somehow have more tolerance for pain. Uh, so, next slide. It also, the creation of these myths to get European peoples to accept the morality of the enslavement of African people require the intentional erasure of the history of the great contributions that African people have made to the development of civilization. 
it's my view that public education at all levels has the awesome responsibility of teaching children and adults about the history and contributions of all of the peoples who make up the American population. Let's take a look at some historical facts. All of the best archaeological and now genetic in, uh, evidence indicates that the various branches of humanity evolved from the original humans who dawned into consciousness in East Central Africa and then migrated to populate the rest of the continents. In fact, Africans were the first human beings and everybody on this planet, if you go far enough back in their mitochondrial DNA, you are going to get to an African woman. Next slide. Another fact is that because Africans were the first people on earth and everyone else evolved from those original Africans, it would stand to reason that Africans were also the first developers of civilization and the first builders of nations. We have the examples of the Nile Valley civilizations such as Nubia and Kemet, uh, currently called Egypt, um, which both predate Rome and Greece. And in fact, we have abundant evidence that the Greeks came into ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt and studied, and much of what we call Greek philosophy is in fact stolen African philosophy. We also have the evidence of the Sudanic empires of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai, which were highly developed nation states in West Africa. Uh, many people have heard of the head of the, the king of the Mali Empire, Mansa Musa, and the Hajj that he engaged in going across land to Mecca, and how he took so much gold with him that he disrupted the economies of several societies that he passed through, and that the value of gold, in fact, decreased because he distributed so much gold. But what is not known uh, quite as widely is that those stories of Mansa Musa's Hajj filtered back to Europe and that uh, the, the desire to find the source of this gold in West Africa is really what drove the initial European exploration of the West Coast of Africa. And once that source of gold was found and uh, European countries were extracting tons of gold per year, that provided the financing for the voyages that led to the colonization of the so-called Western Hemisphere. Now, there's a very important book by Alvin Toffler. Many people are familiar with the first book he wrote called uh, Future Shock. Uh, in the late 1970s, he wrote a second book called The Third Wave. And in that book, he talked about European control of the earth. And he said in 1492, when Columbus first set foot in the so-called New World, Europeans control only 9% of the globe. By 1801, they ruled a third. By 1880, two-thirds. And by 1935, Europeans politically control 85% of the land surface of the Earth and 70% of its population. So I want to introduce a term here, and that term is the global system of white supremacy. So often when we hear that term white supremacy, we think about people perhaps marching with hoods on and burning crosses. But really, white supremacy is a system that is much more subtle than that. And it is really rooted in this imperialism that's talked about in this slide. Next slide. We also uh, can't ignore the colonial legacy and its impact on Africa and uh, subsequently African-Americans. Um, so beginning in 1663, the British established Fort James in what is now the Gambia. And in 1885, this scramble for Africa culminated in the infamous Berlin Conference in which uh, the governments of Western Europe divided up Africa like a pie or a Christmas turkey. Uh, by the middle of the last century, only Liberia and Ethiopia were still independent nations on the African continent. Next slide. And this is a visual representation of what I just explained, the two gray areas. 
On the right-hand side is Ethiopia, the larger country, and the smaller gray area. On the left side is Liberia. And the rest of Africa was uh, colonized by the various European powers that are listed there. Next slide. We also have the, the terrible legacy of enslavement. And there are various arguments by scholars about how many Africans were enslaved and forcibly transported to the so-called Western Hemisphere. But even low estimates put that number at 10 to 20 million people. Next slide. In those countries that were colonized, um, Africa and the Caribbean schooling was used as a tool to maintain colonial and later neo-colonial rule to keep people from rising up against the control by the white minority who was extracting resources uh, from their lands and, and was controlling things politically. In the United States, education or schooling was used to, to push an incomplete narrative about our collective history, which centered the worldview and the experience of people from Europe. Next slide. White supremacy continues to be pervasive <coughs> in American society, in every American institution, including schools, from pre-K to postdoctoral uh, opportunities. Next slide. Again, schools at all levels continue to uphold white supremacist notions in very subtle ways and Eurocentric views, such as, next slide, um, such as the history of the Western Hemisphere being typically taught from the point of view of European conquerors. And of course, this is General George Armstrong Custer. Uh, until perhaps 20 years ago, a school uh, very near where Marshall Bullock and I grew up was called General George Armstrong Custer Elementary School. It is now called Thurgood Marshall School. And I hope that we'll see a continuing trend of changing the names of schools uh, from the names of people who were conquerors and murderers of the indigenous population and also enslavers of Africans. Next slide. The experiences and the worldview of the indigenous populations of the Western Hemisphere and of enslaved Africans is marginalized in most classrooms. And we want to kind of invisibilize the fact that there were multiple nations of indigenous people on this land that we call the United States of America, who were dispossessed of their land and uh, populations were decimated. Next slide. Another way that we see this uh, system of white supremacy manifesting itself and Eurocentricity is that European scientists and mathematics mathematicians are given undue credit for the discovery of formulas, theorems, and laws. Uh, one example of this is the so-called Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Now, clearly Pythagoras didn't invent this because we have examples of temples in ancient Egypt, which are still standing to this day, which utilize the so-called Pythagorean theorem thousands of years before Pythagoras was born. Next slide. So we still have this lingering impact of the legacy of colonialism, enslavement, and white supremacy. Currently, African-American children continue to be deprived of the knowledge that connects them to their own historical and cultural continuum. Meanwhile, the rest of the society is deprived of the knowledge of the ways in which the children of Africa have contributed to shaping the modern world. Next slide. So we have the awesome responsibility uh, and the great possibility of ushering in a new era which affirms the humanity of us all by ensuring that the history and culture of African people is taught in our schools. Next slide. Uh, there's a couple of things that are needed. We need, of course, institutional and policy change that prioritizes the teaching and learning of African 
in African-American history and culture. And let me pause for just a minute and say that I'm currently 67 years old, uh, but I have been fighting for fair inclusion of African-American history and culture in schools since I was in the eighth grade in 1969. And so we can't allow another 50 or more years to go by without making substantial changes in the worldview that our approach to education is rooted in, and we can't allow another 50 or 60 years to go by where African-American children are deprived of a robust understanding of their own history and culture, and we certainly can't let another 50 or 60 years go by before the general American populace has the opportunities to learn about the tremendous contributions that African and African-American peoples have made to the development of the United States and world civilization. Next slide. So we have the individual work that's needed in order to rid ourselves of the many ways that our internalization of notions related to white supremacy and black, brown, and indigenous inferiority show up. The reality is that you cannot live in American society and not have internalized these ideas that suggest that somehow white people are innately better, more intelligent, have the answers for themselves and everybody else, that their culture is the highest standard that by which all humanity should be judged, and that you, black, brown, and indig indigenous people are somehow inferior. And in fact, even more dangerously, uh, the system encourages black, brown, and indigenous people to internalize this sense of inferiority, and that continues because we don't have a robust understanding of our own history and culture while we are inundated with uh, a constant barrage of European history and European culture. Next slide. Uh, thank you for your time. If you would like uh, to get back with me and continue this discussion, you can feel free to email me. I hope that uh, the Michigan State Board of Education uh, takes seriously this call to action and that you find ways to make sure that the contributions of Africans and African Americans are taught in a robust, fair, and just manner in Michigan schools, not just during Black History Month, but 12 months out of the year. Thank you so much for your time. Mr. Yakini. thank you very much for your presentation. Please don't leave just yet. Uh, I'm be here. Because I, 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 I knew you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't head for the virtual exit before we were finished. Um, thank you for the presentation. Board members, any questions or comments of Mr. Yakini? I just... Dr. Pugh. Thank you for the presentation. I am a member of the co-op, and thank you oh, for your chili. Uh, for bringing us another great uh, presentation. Um, very thought-provoking and definitely hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you so much. Glad you're a member of the Detroit People's Food Co-op. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Other, others? Uh... Well, I, I'd just like to thank, uh, so as he stated, this Malik is like a, a big brother to me, lived across the street from me almost my entire life. And, uh, so he's like one of the people I watched who journeyed upon this path of knowing our culture, knowing our history. And to this day, he's still at the pinnacle. Like he's the high, he's one of the guys or people who are at the hierarchy. I've read books, but I know him personally. And so these, these things about like black people have endured some of the, mo the worst atrocities on the planet and yet we've still been some of the greatest contributors to society. And he has been a promoter and advocate for that and, and the loss of black wealth through farming. And so like he's been a great inspiration and an educator throughout the world, not just in Michigan. And so these are, this is a person I admire and look up to. And he's one of my elder Eagle Scout brothers. So we, we, we come from the same troop. Okay, I, I appreciate you sharing that. We we often don't get the personal at the board table, and um, it helps to bring it home. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bullock. Uh, let me just say this on behalf of the neighborhood that we come from. We're very proud of Senator Bullock and the, the upstanding way which he has moved through electoral politics and his consistent advocacy 
on behalf of our community. Uh, he has a very high character, and we can't give him anything but praise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yakini. Ms. Lipton. Thank you so much, Mr. Yakini, for that presentation. Um, <laughs> the question I have is, um, I'm always interested in, you know, sitting at this table, you know, what um, what we can do better. Uh, are there states that, um, in your opinion, are doing a better job um, of incorporating um, African and African American history and culture uh, into their curriculum? I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, you know, a month, you know, might be nice and recognition and activities, but it really should be an all year. So can you point us to or suggest us to, are there states in your opinion that are doing a better job? Well, I, I certainly don't want to compare Michigan to other states, uh, but I will say this, that in the 1980s, Oregon developed, uh, Portland, Oregon developed a series of what they call baseline essays on various topics various academic disciplines that looked at the contribution of African people. And those baseline essays have been used as the basis of developing uh, African studies curriculums throughout the United States. But we can look right to the city of Detroit, which in the 1990s developed what was called the African Center uh, Mandate, where the Board of Education voted that all schools in Detroit public schools will be what they call at that time African-centered schools and would teach African and African-American history in a robust way. So the, 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 in fact, I used to work for Detroit public schools developing uh, what was called the African-American life and history strands. So the information is there. The curriculum materials are there. And one of my slides, I even showed a textbook developed by Malefe Asante that talks about African-American history in a fair and balanced way. The question is not a question of whether or not the materials are there or the knowledge is out there. The question is always, is there the political will to challenge the existing system that gives privilege to people who are designated as white or who identify themselves as white and continues to dehumanize and devalue the culture and historical experiences of black people and other people of color? It's a question of political will. If you want to make the change, the materials are, are out there, and uh, uh, a search would up up uh, would would unturn those materials, and they are still pretty much as valuable today as they were in the 1980s and 1990s when they developed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, other, Miss um, Tilly. Thank you so much, Baba. Thank you so much, Tiffany. So um, my my children attended Insaroma Institute, um, where Baba was the director. And in African-centered learning schools, we call the men Baba and the women Mama, um, and may say their last names as a term of respect and endearment. And... Um, I really appreciate Baba for coming or for come, visiting us virtually today and just bringing so much knowledge to the table. Um, I do want to add that I do want to add the contributions of the uh, during the Moorish rule that Black people um, added um, to civilize parts of Europe and bring bring it out of the Dark Ages. Um, and that was pre-slavery for about 700 years or so. Um, I think that time was very significant, and that is something that we don't get taught about, unfortunately. Um, I well, thank hope. You. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say I hope that these conversations are ongoing. I think you are you're hitting the nail on the head that. Um, the curriculum in schools need to it needs to change um, when it comes to African American history and African history, not only for African American students but all students. Um, we need to share the contributions that that Black people have made. You know, we 
sometimes there are a lot of misconceptions and people bring in their own perspectives when they don't earnestly know, you know, about the contributions that black people have made. And sometimes there's negative connotations uh, attached to black people just in society. So um, it would be helpful, you know, if our K through 12 schools did um, implement curriculum that showed us in a brighter light, like you said, not just during Black History Month. So thank you so much, Tiffany. And I, I want to just expand a bit on what you said about the Moors. Uh, so for those who might not be aware, from 711 until 1492, a group of Africans and Arabs who were Muslim uh, controlled the Iberian Peninsula, what is now Spain and Portugal, and built more than 17 major universities in Spain uh, that helped, as Tiffany said, to bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. Ironically, one of the things that the Moors introduced was the study of optics and of shipbuilding. And it was the development of the telescope and the astrolabe that enabled uh, the, the Portuguese and the Spanish to develop the ships that ultimately explored not only the west coast of Africa, made their way around the Cape of Good uh, Hope at, in southern Africa and entered the Indian Ocean, but also that enabled the European powers to come to the so-called Western Hemisphere and colonize first the islands of the Caribbean and then uh, much of South America, Central America, and North America. So in an in a ironic sense, the, the scientific knowledge that the Moors brought to Spain enabled or equipped Spain to, uh, to engage in the colonial conquest that uh, ensued for the next couple of hundred years. Uh, finally, I want to say that one of the problems is, one of the challenges is, as you all know, uh, what is measured is what matters. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, unfortunately, we live in a, an environment where education is test-driven. And, uh, you know, many, many educators have said that, you know, high stakes are for tomatoes, not for children. Uh, but unfortunately, this is the, um, the paradigm that we are locked into at this point, you know, standardized test. And so, uh, the problem is that Schools are only judged successful if judged to be successful if students perform well on standardized tests. But the history and culture of people of African descent is, for the most part, absent on those standardized tests. And so teachers are forced to, re to teach what is being tested. In fact, the success, my, my experience as a school principal, is the success of a school is dependent upon the alignment of the curriculum, the instruction. <clears throat> evaluation. And so uh, we have a massive job to do because not only does curriculum have to be changed, but also the testing has to be changed or else teachers won't have the time to teach these other essential things that currently are not appearing on those tests. The, the science, the engineering, the architecture, going back to the more that they brought, um, helped significantly um, in Europe, but also Europe was highly illiterate. And the literacy um, that they taught them, the reading, the writing, um, how to create paper, that helped usher Europe into one of their um, profound moments in time, which was the Renaissance era. Absolutely. And the same can be said for ancient Kemet. I mentioned briefly that the Greeks, in fact, went into ancient Kemet or Egypt to study in what was called the mystery system. And much of the knowledge about science, mathematics, and philosophy that is attributed to the Greeks, they in fact learned in Northeast mm. Africa. So Africans have historically played the role of helping to uplift <laughs> civilization, helping to spread uh, both scientific uh, knowledge, but also kind of a, a spiritual understanding that allows us to live in harmony with the earth and the, an the animals and plants that we share the earth with. So, I don't all of that knowledge is suppressed when we suppress the history of African people. Absolutely. I, I was going to I don't, I don't, I want to go back to like not being lost on Ms. Uh, Member Lipton's question about what we can, like Mal Brother Malik's ultimate goal is black history is American history. Black history is world history. And at the end of the day, as the chairman of the, 
Black Caucus, Le Michigan Legislative Black Caucus, we just wanted to make sure that it's being taught inclusively. So I know who invented the light bulb, but we forget to talk about Lewis Latimer, which makes the light bulb stay. The microphone, our, our every day, black history is around us in every facet of life, but we're not taught that. And then culturally about the standardized testing, you call it a kettle, you call it a teapot, but I'm gonna write what I know. I'm gonna answer how I know. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to give me, when it's really the same thing, but if I don't say it the way you've instructed me, I, you've required me to say it, <laughs> then I'm, I'm, I'm penalized for that. And these are things we just want to make sure get through. It, it, is, it is every day of our existence. We are all in this together. Thank you, Senator Bullock. And I, I want to stress again that this is really a call to action, uh, that uh, this wasn't just a presentation to kind of feel good that, you know, black people have contributed to American society and to the world and that we're, you know, we can check off on our list that we've celebrated Black History Month. This is a call to action and really a challenge to you all to act decisively in a way that changes this paradigm that is still centering the experience of people of European descent and marginalizing the experience and the history of African people and other people of color in this society. I, I would hope that you would take seriously this call to action and that we will see uh, some fundamental changes that will that will impact the educational experience of children in the state of Michigan. Uh, please, Mr. McMillan. Uh, yeah, Mr. Yakini. So I, I just want to make sure to confirm you're not suggesting that, you know, seven, eight or nine year old kids in public schools should be told that they are part of a white supremacist society, like, a, you know, white kids that they are oppressors and that they're oppressing uh, African American, you know, black kids. You're not suggesting anything like that, or their parents might be a part of a white supremacist society and that they might be oppressors. You wouldn't be advocating anything like that, right? Uh, it sounds like you've been reading the, the false news reports about critical race theory. Uh, no, I'm not suggesting that, okay. but I'm suggesting that we all uh, have a better understanding of our humanity okay. if we have an accurate understanding of history. Okay. That includes both the glorious parts and also the parts that are dingy, uh, dark, and we would rather hide. And so, uh, you know, we always have to be concerned about age appropriateness and how and what and how we teach children. Mm -hmm. But we also have to be concerned about making sure that children are rooted in an understanding of history that is, in fact, true and accurate. So that's what I'm advocating. Okay. And, and also, just to make sure, you also would certainly support... Martin Luther King Jr.'s, you know, that we should be judging people not based on the color of their skin, but the content of their character, right? Uh, certainly, uh, you know, skin is skin color is a, a, a very shallow way of judging anyone. And certainly cool. uh, there are black people who have done tremendous, uh, tremendously good things. And there are black people who have done tremendously bad things. There are white people who have done tremendously good things and white people who have done tremendously bad. This is part of the human character. Right, that no group is all good or all bad. So certainly, I would uh, suggest that individuals are judged by their actions, or in some case, their lack of action, because also lack of action can amount to uh, a very detrimental impact. So human beings should be judged, I think, by their actions, their lack of actions, and their character. Thank you. I'd, I'd, I'd actually like to sort of counter the the misnomer question about advocating for teaching seven, eight-year-olds that their or their parents are white supremacists while young black and brown children are taught the imagery that they were slaves and they come from a deficient or a subculture. So if you have the idea that you don't want one side to be taught this, this, this uh, leaning proposition that they don't know the truth about what has happened, then why should we teach the other side the truth about what happened? So we have to be fair in our prognosis or diagnosis of how we, we, we disseminate the information. So if we're just going to tell the truth, let the truth be told, bad and good, and, and hopefully the teachers that are in the room are there to explain 
the human nature of these incidents and these cultures and where we've evolved from and, and make this world a better place. You know, and certainly if I could respond also, um, I don't know if this is what your intent was, but I, I reference critical race theory, which most people who mention it really frankly don't even know what it is, but certainly there's been a tide sweeping the country uh, in Florida, Texas, and other states where we see books being banned and curriculums being altered because there's a tremendous fear on the part of some whites that the teaching of an accurate history will somehow demonize uh, them and those who look like them. And so I would just challenge you all to have the moral courage to teach history and culture in a way which is fair and balanced and which affirms all human beings and which also affirms that no group of human beings is all good or all bad, that we have all had flaws. And in fact, that's the reason for teaching history in the first place, so we can gain wisdom from past experiences. And we can only do that if we're open and honest about that history. Dr. Pugh. Just thinking, um, growing up in Saginaw, Michigan, we had the, I, I, my father taught at a community college um, Delta College, and they had a, um, I was talking about this last month, the Black Services and the Chicano Latino wing um, of the community college. And so having the opportunity to uh, see on repeat and, and have conversations with people like Preston Wilcox, who really talked about education out of Harlem and making sure that community was involved in education. So, I mean, those opportunities allow people to understand why we talk about our children. You know, it, we're, we're about village. Um, had the opportunity to study under people like um, Dr. Robert Williams, who came up with the term Ebonics, um, and even bring him to, the, to our college campus and talk about when we were first talking about celebrating cultural diversity. And then um, Kawanza, Kawanza Kanjufu, who was talking about the IQ uh, testing. So he he was the first person who I heard talking about testing and how uh, to some of the points that you men mentioned, uh, Senator Black, around how things can mean different things to different uh, folks and different cultures. But really um, helped me because I went to a predominantly white school, but helped me to be proud of who I was, um, even though there were times when when um, I felt like I had to assimilate. Um, still had that to, to stand on. But I think as we talk about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, as we talk about the workforce, you know, as we talk about education, of course, but just thinking about these spaces that, um, that black people are showing up in and making sure that they can show up as their true authentic self and that they have that space to do that. Um, so that's another purpose of making sure that we have a comprehensive um, and accurate depiction of, of who we are so when so we can feel comfortable um, being that 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 person and and not have to check out of society um, which happens so thank you so much I, I smiled as you heard as I heard you mention several names uh, I in fact knew Preston Wilcox and had a chance to visit his Afram op operation in Harlem uh, Jawanza Kenjufu actually used to come speak to my classes when I was a Detroit public school teacher, and I've known him for uh, close to 50 years as well. And I agree completely with what you're saying, that African American studies is important because it helps bolster the self-esteem of African American children. But I just want to add the other side of that equation, and that is that people who consider themselves to be white also cannot be fully human unless they have an understanding of African and African-American history. Uh, the, the reality is that, well, first of all, as, uh, as has been demonstrated on some of the popular television shows by Dr. Henry Louis Gates, that some white people who would imagine themselves to be pure white are not that in fact, and in fact have African blood in them. And so African history is their history as well. But also, as I said, all of the uh, scientific evidence available to us uh, affirms that even people who consider themselves to be white, if you go far enough back in their mitochondrial DNA, the DNA that's on the mother's side, that you're going to get to African people. And so even people who would imagine themselves white 
if you go far enough back in their ancestry, you're going to find Africans. And so for those reasons, and also because of the tremendous contributions that African people have made to American society in general, and I listed several of those in my uh, presentation, that while it's critical that African American people learn this history and it bolsters our sense of self-esteem, it's also critical that white people and other ethnic groups learn it so that they can be more fully human. Uh, if you deprive yourself of the knowledge, the great knowledge, which is uh, developed out of the experience of African people, as well as the great knowledge that is and wisdom that is developed out of the experience of the indigenous populations and other people of color, then we all are at a loss because of it. Thank you very much, Mr. Yakini, Dr. Pugh, uh, Dr. Robinson, to you. I just want to clarify something that I heard. I've been a teacher for over 40 years. I'm married to a teacher and I spent a lot of time in schools with teachers. I have never heard any teacher tell a seven-year-old white child that they are an oppressor. What I'm concerned about is if we don't teach the truth about our nation's history, including the ugly parts, too many of our kids will run the risk of becoming oppressors due to blind spots in their rear view mirror about our history. So I just want to set that record clear. Seven-year-old white children are not being taught that they are oppressors in public schools. We do need to teach the truth about our country's history. Thank you, sir. That's very well said. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Uh, anyone else for the good of the group? Going once, twice, thrice. I Love you, bro. And I, I thank you again so much for, and we asked him, I think back in the summer of 2022, and he, he's, thank you so much for honoring um, the conversation and, and the invitation. Thank you so much for your work to educate our children in the Metro Detroit area and beyond and for educating us today and for giving us um, some action items to do. Thank you. Thank you again for the invitation, Tiffany. Thank you, Dr. Rice and your staff for facilitating it. Thank you, homeboy, uh, Senator Bullock. <laughs> and thank you to the other board members for uh, listening and considering the ideas that I presented to you. Thank you, Mr. Yakini. Be well. Thank you. Uh, board members, I'm going to move down to the other end to do the report of the superintendent. So does, so does Member Pugh, Madam Chair, get to sit in the She gets a big seat. She gets the big seat. <laughs> the chair moves with the chair. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Let's see how it is. <laughs> He's You're afraid getting, I might like it. You know. <laughs> You're, You're going to get another promotion. Get comfortable. Get comfortable. Get a big chair and move it over there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Okay. All right, board members, um, I want to take you through uh, a couple of important efforts quickly. Um, there's been a lot that's taken place recently. I want to try to bring you up to speed as quickly as possible. The governor released her fiscal year 24 executive budget on school aid um, last week. And uh, I'm going to share with you what that budget looks like from the lens of our top 10 strategic education plan goals. I'm going to begin with goal eight, uh, adequate and equitable school funding, and then I'm going to go uh, one through seven thereafter. Mm -hmm. Under Goal 8, the provision of adequate and equitable school funding, this outstanding fiscal year 24 budget request of the governor recommends $614 million to increase base funding from $9,150 to $9,608 per pupil, an increase of $458 per student or a 5% increase. The budget also, the budget recommendation also increases by 5% three groups of uh, specifically challenged students, economically disadvantaged students, English learners, and students in rural and isolated districts. 5% increases in each of these categorical uh, programs, $66.5 million increase for the three. In addition, a $79 million, almost an $80 million increase for special education students as well. This budget request of the governor 
would increase by $36 million over three years, the dollars for partnership districts. Currently, they're getting $6 million a year. If the governor's recommendation for this particular element were uh, voted into law, it would be an additional $12 million a year, up to $18 million a year for partnership districts. $500 million in additional funding to be deposited in the school consolidation and infrastructure fund. $500 million to help offset MIPSR's retirement obligations, $150 million for electrical vehicles, $900 million deposited into a rainy day fund. Goal one of the state's top 10 strategic education plan is the expansion of early childhood learning opportunities. The governor recommends a 5% increase in the GSRP per child allocation, again, from $9,150 to $9,608 per student consistent with the K-12 increase that she is recommending. She recommends an expansion of eligibility from 250% of the federal poverty level to 300% of the federal poverty level, le level with the opportunity to flex to 400 in certain circumstances. She also recommends another $18 million for GSRP transportation. We have shared with the legislature since before winter break with the administration since before winter break, and we're going to continue at it. We're delighted that the governor is on board with this. The need for a budget supplemental as quickly as possible to help us expand GSRP. The governor has recommended GSRP startup grants, the amount of $50 million, expanded GSRP programming, which we recommended the incentivization of five-day instructional week as opposed to four-day. 36 to 38 week instructional year as opposed to 30 week instructional year, GSRP marketing, and help with the early childhood workforce as well. Goal two of the state's top 10 strategic education plan is the improvement of early literacy achievement. The governor recommends $300 million for the creation of My Kids Back on Track program, $300 million for professional development curriculum literacy supports, and letters training, which we're leaning heavily into, as the State Board of Education knows, and $94.4 million for literacy-related programs in Detroit based on the Gary B. versus Whitmer settlement. The governor also is recommending $14.5 million for early literacy district grants, $10.5 million increase for early literacy coaches. This would be a, a one-third increase in the early literacy coaches, and $4 million for the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. Goal three of the state's top 10 strategic education plan is the improvement of health, safety, and wellness of all learners. The governor recommends $300 million for the My Climate Plan slash Healthy Schools Grant Program, to which I believe Dr. Pugh was referring earlier in her remarks. $160 million for free meals for all students, $1 million for school meal debt forgiveness, $25 million for school health center facilities improvement, this being a one-time, $9 million for cybersecurity assessments of school technology infrastructure. Under goal three, the improvement of health, safety, and wellness, the governor also recommends a $28.9 million increase in Section 31N, to which Dr. Golzinski referred during her presentation, $300 million for um, the increase of per-pupil mental health payments over the next two years. $300 million for the continuation of per-pupil school safety payments to public schools and also to non-public schools. $7.5 million increase in CTE equipment grants. This is goal four, uh, the expansion of secondary learning opportunities for all students. $7.5 million increase in CTE equipment grants. $10 million one-time CTE added cost reimbursements. As you know, board, we're strongly supportive of boosting our CTE programs across the, the state. They're outstanding programs, and our CTE uh, office, led by Dr. Brian Piles, does a terrific job. We educate uh, approximately 106, 107,000 students in CTE programs across the state, just under 24% uh, of our uh, high school students a year, but we believe that we can do more and better than that. Likewise, we think that we can expand upon APIB, early middle college, dual enrollment, and um, special education transition services as well. The governor recommends under goal five, 
the, in, in the, the increase in the percentage of students who graduate from high school, $15 million in one-time funding to pilot support programs for adult education. These are people that are adults. They did not graduate from high school, but they still have the capacity to um, improve upon their education and the interest in improving upon that education. Goal six of the state's top 10 strategic education plan is the increase in the percentage of adults with a post-secondary credential board members. This is the governor's 60 by 30 goal in another name, if you will. Um, we have increased this percentage over the last few years in the state from 45% to 50%, which is great. Governor would like to see this up to 60% by 2030, and she recommends the following investments to help us get there. $15 million to incentivize high school students to complete their FAFSA form. In fact, I just completed a, a, a letter which talked about the, the importance of student aid to higher education success. $55 million for student success programs in the 60 by 30 office, which is in the LEO budget, Labor and Economic uh, Opportunity budget, $140 million for a Michigan Reconnect expansion within LEO. And this funding would help to expand the Michigan Reconnect program to those individuals 21, 22, 23, and 24 year old. Currently, it's 25 years old and older. This would also provide $75 million for a Michigan Reconnect bachelor's degree pathway program as, uh, as well. Goal seven of the state's top 10 strategic education plan is an increase in the number of certified teachers in areas of shortage. Public Act 144 of 2022, which was uh, approved last summer, uh, roughly concurrent with the <coughs> approval of fiscal year 23 budget, established a $305 million fund for future educator fellowships, what many of us would call scholarships, and $50 million for Michigan future educator stipends to help student teachers get through that last semester. Because we know, Dr. Kenneshek, that we're no longer in a buyer's market for talent like we were for so many years in, in our career. We're in a seller's market for, for talent. It's a tougher, um, tougher labor market, and we're working to change that. So we need to pay those who are student uh, teaching rather than have them pay for that experience. Uh, this uh, fiscal year 24 executive recommendation of the governor would add $25 million for fellowships, $50 million to stipends to the dollars already noted in the presentation. The governor is also recommending $25 million for the mentoring and induction of new teachers, counselors, and administrators. Um, and $15 million for the establishment of rural educator credentialing hub to support prospective educators through certifications and career experiences. Board, know that most of these uh, efforts around teacher shortage were incubated in the department, were recommended to the governor, recommended to the legislature, and ultimately they chose from our menu of, of ideas and, and continue to choose from that, that menu of ideas to address the teacher shortage in the state. And the work is, is ongoing, but it is increasingly successful. We can see it in the number of young people in teacher prep programs across the state. $5 million uh, for administrator slash principal training for special education, $50 million to assess the needs of the early childhood workforce, to update and promote career pathways, uh, training and credentialing piloting programs, and increase recruitment efforts because Dr. Chapman, what we know is that this is not a, a shortage simply in K-12. It's also a shortage for pre-K teachers as uh, well. We've asked for the legislature to swiftly pass the following to help us with the teacher shortage. Uh, we've encouraged the legislature to pass educator and counselor reciprocity bills. These would lower the barrier for entry into the profession from teachers and counselors certificated out of state who want to come to Michigan. Each year we have a thousand teachers a year who are initially certified outside of Michigan, subsequently within Michigan. And we'd like to lower that regulatory barrier to increase 
that number. We're talking about veteran teachers certified elsewhere. We'd like to make it easier for them to come into the state while we continue to have a teacher shortage. An expansion of substitute teacher candidate pool, um, not different from uh, or consistent with any way what was passed last year by the legislature. And then we need to be um, uh, more welcoming of our teachers who have retired returning to help out in our school. Simply because a person has retired doesn't mean that they don't have any tread left on their tire, Dr. Pritchett. Many people who have retired are, are in fact, uh, full of vim and vigor. Uh, my, uh, my grandmother and my great-grandmother had a different way of, uh, of saying it, but that's after 6 p.m. Uh, language. So we need to find ways that we can have our retired teachers come back uh, quickly to, uh, to, to help us out. And we've encouraged the legislature to swiftly address each of these areas. I want to thank the following individuals, um, among others, who helped to quickly unpack this, uh, this budget. Uh, it really does uh, take a village to, um, to do the work of the department, and department staff do a terrific job. That's on budget. But I do think we, um, we would benefit from some brief conversation about African-American authors, given that it is Black History Month. And I do think that there's a value to lift up particular authors to give you a sense of how we're lifting up the power of diversity in literacy. We think it's very important that children read diversely, that children see themselves in their literature, mirrors that they see one another in uh, literature, windows, and that they're able to enter others' worlds, sliding glass doors. Amen, uh, Beth Gonzalez? So in that spirit, um, nine black authors, very quickly. So Paul Lawrence Dunbar was born in 1872. He was born in Dayton, Ohio, uh, where I grew up. A poet, a novelist, a short story writer, a lyricist, and unknown to me when I was growing up. We weren't told about Paul Lawrence Dunbar. We did not read about Paul Lawrence Dunbar. We did not inquire why there was a Dunbar High School in Dayton. I did not become aware of Paul Lawrence Dunbar until after I graduated from college and began to teach in Washington, D.C., which had its own Dunbar High School and began to reflect upon what I had read, which had been terrific, just not comprehensive. I had read wonderful works, just not comprehensively. Zora Neale Hurston was born in 1891. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston was part of the Harlem Renaissance. She would uh, write extensively in the 30s and the 40s. She was arguably the most famous African-American female writer of the 30s and 40s. She would move to Florida or move back to Florida in her last uh, 10 or 12 years of her life. And she would die in relative anonymity. Um, 15 years after her death, Alice Walker went in search of her gravestone. And Alice Walker, famous Alice Walker, who wrote The Color Purple, um, was surprised not to have found a gravestone. Uh, what she found was that Zora Neale Hurston was buried in a pauper cemetery. And so she put a marker down as close to the site of Zora Neale Hurston's grave as she could uh, find. Zora Neale Hurston um, wrote brilliantly, including Their Eyes Were Watching God. And if you have not read Their Eyes Were Watching God, it is, uh, it is truly a, a brilliant piece of work. Zora Neale Hurston, a cultural anthropologist, long before uh, there, uh, there were cultural anthropologists um, in her world, studied at Columbia University, uh, remade herself on a number of occasions, um, well deserving of study in the literary canon. And it was Alice Walker, and then by extension, Henry Louis Gates Jr., Skip Gates Jr., who helped resurrect or excavate uh, Zora Neale Hurston from the literal and figurative grave of anonymity. Langston Hughes was born in 1901, died in 1967. 
Langston Hughes, uh, for more than 40 years, uh, wrote poetry. He wrote short stories. He wrote a single novel, didn't particularly like novel writing. He wrote two autobiographies, One Life, Two Autobiographies, go figure. Um, he wrote an opera. Um, he wrote essays. He wrote a column for the Chicago Defender, a black newspaper for many years. Um, Langston Hughes, a brilliant writer, hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken-winged bird that cannot fly. Gwendolyn Brooks, born in 1917, died in 2000. First African-American to win a Pulitzer Prize, a Pulitzer Prize in poetry. She won it in 1950 for Annie Allen. Uh, beautiful, understated uh, poetry um, by a very... Uh, gentle, poignant soul. Gwendolyn Brooks deserves to be read as a part of the American literary canon. James Baldwin, born in 1924, died in 1987. James Baldwin was a, a child preacher in Harlem, and uh, he wrote Go Tell It on the Mountain, The Amen Corner. He wrote The Fire Next Time. Here's a quote of his, God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time. James Baldwin's uh, writing literally jumps off the page to this day, and he has been dead for 35 years. May he rest in peace. Toni Morrison, born in 1931, died in 2019, the winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature for, uh, among others, The Bluest Eye, Song of Solomon, and Beloved. And um, uh, a note about Toni Morrison that... Um, it is not a paradox, it is a paradox, but it's not a contradiction uh, that you can be both an award-winning author and a band author, uh, because she is, in fact, uh, both a number of her books, including The Bluest Eye, Song of Solomon, and I believe Sula as well, um, have been periodically uh, banned. They are searing, they are powerful, they are poignant, they deserve to be uh, read. Walter Dean Myers, 1937 to 2014, the National Ambassador for Young People's uh, Literature. Uh, Walter Dean Myers um, came to Kalamazoo as the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature a year before he uh, died. I had the opportunity to meet him. Lovely spirit, gentle spirit. Um, funny, poignant, quixotic, uh, wrote more than 100 books in his lifetime, including Monster, which is, uh, which is powerful and surprising, and, 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 and. Mostly wrote for um, middle school and high school children. Um, powerful author. Jason Reynolds, born in 1983, and um, still very much with us. Uh, Jason Reynolds is not yet 40 years old. Uh, he served as the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature um, until uh, just a few months ago. The writer of Long Way Down, among other uh, books, quoted here as saying, it's hard to be what you can't see. A winner of a Coretta Scott King Award, a Newbery Medal, and a Michael L. Prince Award. You, you know, you, can, you think about that and you think that's a lifetime. And uh, Jason Reynolds is not yet 40 years old, so who knows what he's going to write in the next few decades of his, um, of his life. And then finally, Amanda Gorman, 1998, um, Harvard graduate, first National Youth Poet Laureate, um, youngest inaugural poet, uh, recited at the 2021 inauguration, The Hill We Climb. Um, beautiful portion of her poem, The Hill We Climb, <clears throat> just is, isn't always just is. It's a pretty powerful line for, um, for someone who at the time was, I believe, 23 years old. Um, Amanda Gorman has subsequently written um, a book, and... Um, one imagines that she will be quite prolific in, in her lifetime, and one hopes in ours as, as well.
Board members, the department in the Library of Michigan's effort to showcase black authors and literary works is, is an effort for this, um, for this month of Black History Month. We've taken recommendations from Michigan Teachers of the Year, Michigan Regional Teachers of the Year, MDE educators, along with some student recommendations as well. Uh, board members, you should know that we did this in 2021. It was well received. Uh, we got a little bit of a late start on it this year, so we narrowed uh, the pool of people that could recommend uh, to us. The calendar is an extension of other diversity and literacy efforts, diversity and literacy webinars, a thousand educators plus at each of four diversity and literacy webinars, a compendium of authors of color, which we are updating as we speak, equity and literacy guidance as well. These are the authors that we, uh, that we recognized or that were recommended and that we subsequently recognized through our Black History Month um, author's calendar. Um, and you can see the first several days and the next several days as, um, as well. I would be remiss if I didn't mention our comprehensive history instruction webinar series as well. If we expect children to be strong in reading, it's not simply about the how of reading, Ms. Tilly, it's also about the why of reading. The how needs to be stronger, but the why needs to be stronger as well. We've got to do better on the technical side, and we've got to do better on the engagement side as well. So we've pushed on uh, letters training, number one, dyslexia guidance, number two, accelerated learning, number three, all on the how side. Very, very important, all necessary, not sufficient, but all necessary. In addition, we're pushing on the why side as well. Diversity in literacy, comprehensive history instruction, children seeing themselves in their literature, children seeing themselves in their history. Our comprehensive history instruction webinar series began last year with Holocaust education, indigenous people's education. We segued into Asian American history, uh, Asian American peoples in the fall. And now we're working our way through Civil War amendments up to and through the Civil Rights Movement, the Equal Rights Movement, the intersection of the two, Disability Rights Movement, Labor Rights Movement, and then Social Studies Classroom Practice and Pedagogy. Because we think it's important that we teach our teachers how to find materials and, and how to expand upon what they've been taught. Uh, I love history. I love government. I love social studies. Did not like any of them growing up. They were taught in a deadeningly boring way, Dr. Pritchett. I wish I had had you as a teacher for social <laughs> studies instead of some of the people that I, that I did have. Um, I began to enjoy reading history and social studies and and government after I graduated from college and began to expand my, my reading. And that's what we're trying to do with our educators, helping them expand their knowledge of, on the one hand, literature and diverse literature. On the other hand, history instruction, so that they're able to present broader uh, literature and broader history instruction to our uh, children. I want to thank those who worked on the Black History Month um, calendar. Um, I also want to thank uh, Randy Riley from uh, the Library of Michigan, our director from the Library of Michigan, and his staff. They've been, they've been terrific in, in this regard. MDE staff and Library of Michigan have done a really wonderful job. And I also want to thank those who have been involved, um, including but not limited to uh, with special appreciation to Renee Garcia um, for comprehensive history webinar uh, work. And you can see the supporting organizations down uh, below board members. And then I would be remiss if um, less than one day after we lost uh, young people at Michigan State University, if I did not uh, explicitly and directly call on the 148 members of the Michigan State Legislature to do what should have been done years ago by that institution and to pass meaningful gun reform legislation. The 
State Board of Education just a few months ago, as Dr. Pugh noted, passed a resolution based on a survey that was done in the summer. And the survey shared what was probably surprising to many, that Democrats, Republicans, independents, NRA members, and concealed weapon permit holders agree that particular reforms are necessary. That is to say, a majority of each of these seven categories, of each of these five categories, believes that these initiatives that I'm about to raise with you, and that we centered in our resolution to the state legislature, that those elements be passed into statute. The requirement of background checks on all gun sales, including sales at gun shows and other private sales. The enacting of child access prevention law that would hold gun owners accountable for the safe storage of firearms. The preventing of sales of all firearms to people who have been reported to law enforcement as dangerous to them themselves or others. Most of the people who have created these genocidal acts are already known to us. Requiring a waiting period of at least three days after a gun purchase before the gun can be taken home, imposing criminal penalties or fines for those who buy firearms for another person, requiring a person to be age 21 instead of 18 to be able to purchase an assault-style weapon, and establishing a court-issued protection order called an extreme risk protection order. On those elements, Democrats, Republicans, independents, NRA members, and concealed weapon permit holders all test over 50 percent. A majority of each of those groups believes that each of those seven makes sense. There are an enormous number of people who own guns in the country. There's nothing wrong with that. They safeguard those guns. They use those guns appropriately. They're not dangerous to the vast majority of people or anyone. But there are guns in the wrong hands that are a problem. <clears throat> and what we face in our country is different than what exists in other countries. It's certainly more severe. But we've got to clean up our house. Thank you, board members. Thank you. Well, we are um, on the home stretch, but um, every home stretch has a marathon runner <laughs> who's particularly good at the end. And speaking of marathon runners, and someone who can bring it home in the last few miles, our director of the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs, Mr. Marty Ackley. Thank you, Dr. Rice. I do have a good kick, so I'll try to get there today. Um, the state legislature has been meeting uh, for the past several weeks and digging into important legislation. The Senate has passed, as mentioned earlier today, Senate Bill 12, which would repeal the required retention provisions of the Read by Grade 3 law. The House Education Committee was expected to take up the bill today, uh, but session in both the House and Senate have been canceled um, out of respect for what happened at Michigan State University uh, last evening. And uh, as for the schedule, all scheduled committee meetings were canceled in a session, including session. The Senate Education Committee was also scheduled to meet today to take up Senate Bill 63 uh, to allow sinking funds to be used for upgrading school transportation. Um, that meeting will also be rescheduled and that bill will um, come up again. Um, Dr. Rice has made several presentations um, on this session's legislative priorities to the Education Standing Committees in both the House and Senate and the House Appropriations Subcommittee. Um, he has been asked to present before the Senate Education Budget Subcommittee next week on the governor's <coughs> executive budget recommendations for education, um, similar to what he presented just moments ago. Uh, we've also been working with committee chairs and their staffs to finalize bill drafts for several of the legislative priorities that Dr. Rice shared with the board last month and also today. Um, we understand that bills uh, for the common sense uh, gun laws are expected to be dropped soon and to get uh, quick action. The State Board's Legislative Committee met on February 2nd 
and I will hand it over to Dr. Pritchett to share what was discussed during that meeting. All right, thank you. Um, appreciate the uh, input and uh, participation from board member um, Mitch Robinson, Nikki Snyder, and Ellen Lipton. Um, has we've already discussed, and Dr. Uh, Rice spoke about it in his presentation a few minutes ago. Um, we did talk about the teacher council of reciprocity, uh, ability of retired teachers to be employed and the timing around that and support staff of substitute teachers. Marty just indicated that Dr. Rice and Dr. Catherine Strunk um, have testified uh, before the House and Senate Education Committees regarding third grade reading. So, uh, And future things we at least threw out onto the brainstorm list was elementary music instruction, art education in elementary schools, media specialists, uh, related to endorsements and numbers and restoration of funding for universal breakfast and lunch. So we will uh, investigate those as we move forward with legislative committee. Thank you very much, Dr. Pritchett. Uh, Mr. Ackley, any more, um, any questions of Mr. Ackley or Dr. Pritchett? Dr. Pugh. Um, and I know we're not prepared for this, but one, I was just thinking about um, maybe future discussions at, at the legislative meeting around the minimum and tipped wage increase um, that very likely will be going to the Supreme Court. Um, I think that there's two issues with that. Um, there's one, the issue around, you know, the, the obvious making sure that people, moms, dads, caregivers uh, have enough money to put food on the table for children, um, as well as can address some of these inequities that we're talking about. But then there's the whole piece around um, the ballot proposal issue that if someone um, in, this, in this instance where there was a ballot proposal that then went to the legislature and the legislature was able to amend the, the, the proposal. So um, just hoping that we can discuss that. Uh, I want to just step, put that on stack on the, on the agenda. Um, and then as it relates to the legislative committee meetings, just making sure um, that we have the opportunity to add um, <laughs> Senator Bullock and well, just thinking about, about the timing of, yep. of, of those meetings. So it's a little difficult for some of us to, to get into meetings in the middle of the day. Okay. We can look at that. All right, thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Questions or comments going once, twice, thrice, hearing and seeing uh, none. Mr. Ackley, that was very succinct. My pleasure. Um, Dr. Pugh, is this for, for, uh, for Mr. Ackley? We're, we're going to get to your resolution. I have not forgotten. <laughs> I promise. Okay, it thank you so much. Though, okay. Sure. Um, we are, we are at that point where we're going to consider the uh, resolution that Dr. Pugh uh, asked or moved to be put on the agenda at the beginning of the meeting. Um, Dr. Pugh, this was... Um, would you like to... Uh, do you feel the need to reread it? I don't, unless anyone needs me to. That was a long, uh, wordy, it, 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 <laughs> but. but. It, 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 it is long. We are distributing it in writing. Yes. Um, if you want to simply perhaps summarize it in, in a sentence or two, I'd, that would be fine. I'd like to reread it if we can, if that's okay. We could popcorn it if you want. Like in Sunday school? Do you, <laughs> <laughs> do, do you want do you do you want to do you want to reread it? Do you want someone else to reread it? Do you want to do you want to do it. popcorn? <laughs> I'll reread it, um, or we can do popcorn. You like the popcorn? <laughs> is, every, is everyone going to uh, participate? We're getting a little. We're getting a little. We're getting a little slap happy. Yeah. You know? no. I'm not happy with popcorn at all. <laughs> <laughs> a little longer. All right. Well, if I just. <laughs> this and you take it from there if I need need that 
whereas Michigan, the Michigan Department of Education has issued a memorandum dated February 2nd, 2023, to provide guidance and clarity surrounding the issue of sex education, whereas the Department of Education referring to state law on the issue of sex education invokes MCL 380-1506, MCL 380-1507, MCL 380-1507B, MCL 388-1766A, whereas these compiled laws define the legal responsibilities and obligations of school districts and educational entities as related to the scope and delivery of sex education to students, whereas these laws include requirements that a district provide notification to parents prior to offering sex education classes and establish a process to allow parents and legal guardians to excuse their children from sex education classes without penalty, whereas school, school districts have established transparent and standardized processes to opt out of sex education classes, including by making standard opt-out forms available to parents and legal guardians, whereas the Department of Education affirms that sex education includes family planning, reproductive health, and the prevention and treatment of sexually transmitted diseases, whereas the Board of Education applauds all education that can empower young people with information, including factual and evidence-based information that can enable them to determine when they start their families, prevent pregnancies, minimize sickness, and enjoy good health and wellness. Whereas the Board of Education further applauds school districts and the Department of Education for striving to ensure sure that sex education curricula conform to, to developmentally appropriate instruction, whereas while the decisions of parents or legal guardians to remove their child from sex education classes must be respected, the established processes of school districts for opting out of classes must also be preserved for consistency, <laughs> continuity, and accountability solely through the use of a district's legally drafted and legally binding forms. Whereas any deviation from a district standard and established procedures from opting out of approved classes may disrupt the school, its operations, and the education of its students. Therefore, be it resolved that the Michigan Board of Education concurs with the findings of the Department of Education on the teaching of sex education. Therefore, be it further resolved that the Michigan Board of Education encourages school districts to offer standard opt-out forms that are consistent around the district to promote continuity, accountability, efficiency, and transparency. And be it further resolved that the Michigan State Board of Education recommends school districts reject any third-party opt-out forms as invalid, irrelevant, and inconsequential. Okay, so that is the, the motion as read. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Dr. Robinson. Um, Dr. Pugh, to you for discussion. Uh, you, you know, there have been recent attempts um, to uh, basically sow distrust um, between parents and the educators. And um, there is this move um, to use uh, lawfare um, and, and it's been stated to put schools in an imbalance by having an overwhelming number of uh, this new opt-out opportunity that would be redundant and, again, causes confusion. And it's by a group that um, is backed by outside attorneys uh, that have come to our state. And uh, to me, it's, it's an opportunity um, another way for uh, folks to push a don't say gay um, agenda. And it puts our LGBTQ students in particular um, in environments that are not supportive to say the least. Um, I think that it will again cause school districts to be forced, um, or it's the intent, to be forced to uh, make decisions that are not in the best interest of our schools. We do, um, as the Michigan Department of Education, Dr. Rice, you have put out um, a memorandum that talks about what is already in existence. Um, that is an opportunity for parents to be able to opt their children out of, of sex education courses. Um, it's an opportunity for children, for parents to be able to um, have uh, the ability to talk to the school district 
and it's and it uh, a way that's that that provides continuity um, and does not disrupt um, our schools from doing what they need to be doing, and that's educating our children, as well as making sure that all children are supported, um, especially now. Um, in this environment uh, that, that we're in now. So um, that is the, um, the spirit of this resolution. Um, after hearing from multiple parents and parents who represent multiple parents, uh, that this resolution has been written based on that, that voice. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Pugh. Um, others on um, this proposed resolution? Others on the proposed resolution? I'll just say that uh, <clears throat> obviously this has no authority, is that right? This is a uh, resolution of the State Board of Education the way other resolutions right. are resolutions of the State Board. Right, so I just want to make sure it's not reflected as some kind of authority when at the local level. I, you know, I don't. I just uh, would think that um, you know parents hopefully are in charge of their kids' education. Um, you know, it says that this may disrupt the school. It may not, right? I mean, it, these uh, they could say I'd also like to opt out of these things. I think there are some parents that feel that sex education in, has kind of broadened that um, in order to get out from under the opt-out provision. It's been broadened, uh, you know, outside of what is was usually called sex education class, um, and so you know, especially if a school district or a school is fine with it, I um, they certainly can um, adopt these uh, opt-out forms, um, and I, you know, I mean, and, and obviously the resolution isn't stating otherwise. It's not stating that they can't. It's just urging them uh, that if parents uh, want to have an influence uh, more than what uh, something kind of cookie cutter that the district provides that uh, that they should reject uh, the parents interest in um, overseeing the education of their kids so um, I don't see the need for this resolution and uh, certainly would be voting against it okay thank you very much uh, Miss Snyder so I would just reject our president's concept that this is another don't say gay um, initiative. I don't think anybody at this table is rejecting the rights of every American and Michigander in determining or choosing their own sexuality or that human sexuality isn't a topic that is um, essentially related to our rights and that we deserve to live in a country that's free. But if you break down a couple of these paragraphs as it relates to this draft resolution, when you say whereas school districts have established transparent and standardized processes to opt out of sex education classes, you have to break that down um, into the laws that you're referring to. Human sexuality was meant to be contained within those sex education classes, not a topic that's infused into every single standard, every single class, um, even what someone during public comment had to say about the cards that teachers are giving out to students that lead them to an external source that they can uh, explore on their own. That's taking it out of the parents' hands and even the teachers' hands as to what students are accessing as a result of their public education without an adult present. So there's no doubt that this is not a transparent process here, and it's certainly not following the law. Um, so whether you have your own standard opt-out forms or not, the issue at hand that a third party opt-out form is addressing, you're also still not addressing. So you could, you could go tit for tat in terms of opt-out forms, but you're not acknowledging the core issue itself, which is, are you truly being transparent about what kids are being taught in school? And I would argue no. The next paragraph, uh, talks about whereas the Board of Education applauds all education that can empower young people with information, including factual and evidence-based information that can enable them to determine when they start their families. Um, that's a whole kit and caboodle even beyond the concept of teaching about birth control. Um, I certainly don't want our public education system to start to assume that they are the, the um, leader on encouraging 
values as to when you start families with students. So um, again, what, what schools are taking upon themselves to teach or give children access to learn with or without an adult is well beyond what the law actually provides for. So you can, uh, you can take this and make your own standard opt-out form. You're still not addressing the fact that the law is being broken. And I think that that opens up school districts and our public education system to lawsuits. And I don't think it's an attack. I think it's a very real way that parents are engaging with our education system to say there are boundaries. And we want you to respect them. Just a point of clarification. When you say the law is being broken, which law? When you take human sexuality, which is rooted in these MCLs that you're including, and you teach it outside of sex education class, and there's no way for a parent to opt out of it because you're choosing to interpret the, sex edu the laws as only sex education classes they can opt out of, as opposed to human sexuality as a topic that is being taught. So that's your interpretation. I would argue it's a misinterpretation on behalf of Michigan Department of Education, and there's AG opinion to back that up. So this isn't about an attack on schools. It isn't about... Uh, it isn't about an attack on any one group of people. It's the concept of freedom. It's the concept of parental rights in education. And it's the concept of it's okay to establish boundaries of what happens in public education and what doesn't. What happens at home, <clears throat> the values that parents have the right to instill in their children, discrimination in terms of access to education without it. So. Those things apply to this. I, I think that you're interpreting things in a way that makes it so that you feel like you don't have to actually pay attention to them. But lawsuits will tell. We'll see parents that, that probably don't want to continue to deal with this. They want their kids to go to school to learn basics of education. And they want the right to opt out of certain topics that were never meant to be taught in school. Thank you very much. Um, other um, other board members on the resolution as introduced, as seconded? Hearing and seeing uh, none, I feel like we're, we're ready for a caffeine break board. Um, Ms. Cook, a roll call vote, please. Bullock? Yes. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? No. Pritchett? Yes. Pew? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Snyder? No. Tilly? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. We are at that point in the agenda board where we are talking about, uh, we give you the floor uh, additionally. State Board of Education member comments. Wide open for those of you who have the energy for additional comments. <clears throat> I'll Ms. Start. Tilly. I'll warm it up for you guys. Um, I want to thank you for opening up the meeting with a moment of silence for the MSU um, victims and families. Uh, my heart pours out to them, and I know that the board echoes that sentiment. Uh, definitely praying for them. And again, as Pam said, some of us have, have family members that attend there, and that it's just, uh, it was totally scary situation and it's a repeat situation um, in our nation. I'm glad we got the um, resolution out to push for um, stronger gun laws and I believe now is the time and I believe the legislators will do the right things and 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 um, set forth some some new laws. I um, want to give an update on Park West Foundation and the foster youth. Um, the resolution that we passed for the foster youth, I put to the 11th Congressional District under Congresswoman uh, Haley Stevens, and they also passed the resolution there. The Michigan Democratic Party, um, we had our convention this past weekend, and 
the 11th Congressional District um, sent the resolution over to the convention committee. And so now the Michigan Democratic Party <coughs> has adopted it as well. Uh, I took the opportunity to organize the young people along with Saba at the Michigan Democratic Party to, uh, you know, use it as an opportunity to advocate on behalf of the youth and to there's a lot of people including educators that don't know what they're dealing with um, they don't know about the issues with the classes that they're giving given in congregate facilities and other facilities for juveniles in the system um, that they're not credit bearing and so we went around to um, the different caucus meetings and district meetings to let people know, and they were very well received. Um, I think, again, with this um, situation, the legislators, I know this will be an issue that they're going to deal with this year, but I think that we're going to get some of the laws changed for them as well. And I, I want to say this is a very nonpartisan issue. Um, I'm supporting it definitely as a Democrat, and I know um, Nikki wasn't here when we voted on it, but I'm sure she would support it too. Tom definitely supported it. It's a, a nonpartisan issue, so I hope that it is widely supported um, with our legislators as well as they pass new laws for our, our youth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll stay on the issue until it gets across the finish line. Perfect. But, but as, as we've talked about, um, I think the events of the last uh, 24 hours have changed the sequencing um, of We things. definitely have to focus on gun safety laws. Um, on one other thing, while I'm talking about the youth, uh, we've discussed in the past, I've brought it up in the past, and I know that other things um, were more pressing, especially during COVID, but um, creating a youth um, board or youth council here, um, I think that's something that's still needed. One of the things um, that the foster youth, they, I asked them to create posters, and one of the things on the poster um, this weekend was nothing about us without us. And I think that's imperative, you know, while we're making decisions here at the state board level um, to have students involved and student voice while we're making important decisions that affect them. So I would really like to see us focus on getting that created this okay. year. We have a student advisory council in the department. Um, let's have some conversation. Okay. okay. All right, cool. Thank you. And for on the board. I understand. For, yes. Um, other um, other um, board member comments? Dr. Pritchett. Thank you. Um, I join my colleagues um, in our um, condolences and support to Michigan State University, uh, students, families, faculty. Um, if not now, when is my question? hopefully the legislature are able to move forward with something. Because if we don't start discussing it, if we don't start talking about it, it's not going to happen. And we can't keep this up. Uh, we just can't. Um, I'd like to thank the students this morning. Uh, any board meeting we can start out with uh, students <clears throat> telling us why certain things are important to them in school. Um, is uh, good guidance for us for the rest of the day or possibly even longer than that. So thank you very much for bringing them. I know that takes a lot of coordination, so, and they did a great job. Thanks to Tiffany uh, for the presentation. Um, I learned a lot. I would like a copy of that um, PowerPoint because I think it does a great overview. Um, of black history, at least as an introduction. Uh, and I'd like to share that with some individuals. Um, as Dr. Rice um, indicated, I don't think I was the best social studies teacher, but I did have the privilege to teach social studies when I taught at the high school level. There's nothing better. 
uh, especially when they're seniors and they're ready to, to get out of school, they're a little bit more focused and a little bit more settled down. Um, I think we need to keep in mind whenever we're talking about standards for teacher prep, then we need to trust our teachers. Um, you know, there's not, and Mitch can probably speak to this, there's nothing more fun than a group of social studies teachers in a room together because we think we're Congress and there's a lot of back and forth, back and forth. But when we go out to our students, we work very, very hard in making sure that we are as apolit very apolitical. Um, I had the privilege to teach government one year when there was a presidential election going on and we did a, um, a project and the students didn't know till after the day after the election who I was going to vote for. And those of you who know me, that's a little tough for me sometimes, but they didn't. Uh, because I worked very hard at making sure that they did their own research, that they made their own decisions, even though most of them couldn't vote at that point because they weren't 18 yet. Um, so I just, I, I know there's some standards there, the way they're written, um, and there's concerns out there, but we need to trust our teachers. They know um, their students, um, and I trust them to um, after they've been prepared at the, at the uh, university level and after they've been through student teaching and get the reality of this is what teaching's really about, uh, that they will move forward <coughs> and be um, great social studies teachers because in my opinion anyways, it is citizenship, government, and an understanding, a deep understanding of the history of this country where they will be able to move us forward. Um, because that's what America is all about. So there's my social studies mantra for the day. Thanks. We, we, we appreciate that. Some of us are, are want to be social studies teachers. Yeah. Ms. Lipton. Um, I just wanted to um, acknowledge uh, something that Dr. Rice wrote about in the memo to all of you, the um, community of Hazel Park, which was a district I had the um, privilege of representing when I was in the legislature. And now I have the privilege of being on um, the, the board of the Promise Zone uh, for Hazel Park. Uh, we welcomed Dr. Rice. The community was absolutely um, energized and appreciated. Um, Dr. Rice uh, was accompanied by Mark Howe and had a chance to see the great work that um, uh, a community that has really pulled together for its school district, um, the great things that they can do, um, and really all of the great things that they will continue to do as we achieve a more equitable system of funding our schools. So, so thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Rice, for making that visit. It was very much appreciated by the community. It was, um, it was a very interesting visit. Um, I learned a lot, and um, the superintendent is very, very strong. Um, in her practice, in her beliefs, um, and in the work that she's done in the in the district, um, I wish I could could get to more schools <coughs> and more districts. Um, there's a paradox about the position that doesn't permit it, um, but um, but I get to as many schools and districts as I can. And I I was originally supposed to be at Hazel Park months ago, but um, life intrudes in life. So, you were happy you. whenever you were you were able to come. It was so. a great visit. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Other other board members, Dr. If, Pugh. If no one else, because everybody else is good. Okay. I just one of the things that I left off uh, during my report was the opportunity to go to the African American Museum in Washington D.C. Uh, for the unveiling of College Board's um, AP. Black History Month um, um, <clears throat> education uh, course. Of course, there was um, a lot that kind of clouded <laughs> that unveiling, but it was still a good unveiling. Of course, I saw a good, our good friend Ben, who um, was able to, to make that happen um, and was able to, to meet uh, Skip Gates. So that's what made me remember that I left that off. And just one other uh, piece that I'm always thinking about, and that is the Gary B versus the state of Michigan case. And I think about that because as we we're talking about some of the pieces that, that we've picked up, even the 
um, literacy, the equity in literacy. And uh, there was a time when we, at that time, we had um, um, Dr. Rice coming on board, but we also had uh, students that were pushing us to improve their schooling and their schools um, that have pushed us um, to do some of these pieces. And I'm thinking of them as a board member Tilly brings up the student um, body. And that was something that they also were hoping to do is to be able to be at decision-making tables. So I definitely support you in, the, in that space. But thinking about them during Black History Month as we're thinking about those who, who have led us, um, and I think about those young students who, who, who helped us to, to move in the right direction. And look, they even got money in, possibly, very likely, is going to be in the budget when people told them that would never happen. And I think about those courageous young people. So just want to mention that as we talk about history. They should be in the books. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any Anyone else for the good of the group? Going once, twice, thrice on this happy Valentine's Day. Uh, March 14th, April 11th, and May 9th are our next three regular meetings, all at 9.30, all on Tuesday, all here. If there are any topics board members would like included in future meeting agendas, please notify uh, Liz uh, and me. We thank Jen Cook for filling in for uh, Liz Evans. That was terrific. Uh, she had some measure of trepidation about it. She did terrifically. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Rice, there will be a retreat that should be coming up, and I think we just need to make sure because we have new two new board, yeah, two new board members that we want to make sure if we know when that is. It's the it's, um, it's the week after the regular board meeting in okay. May. Okay. So it would be Tuesday, May, May 16th. 16th. Okay. Yeah. 